This is a public works plan, right? Oh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> That's what it's called. <laughs> it is. It, I mean, technically, you're right. <laughs> I don't want to tread on your, your territory. <laughs> Where, where is the, God dang it. Mary did a very good staff report. It'd be very I, easy to do. I, I, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying Thank to find you. it. What, the report? Yeah. I'll email it to you right now. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hey, Chris. Hey, Chris. Howdy, howdy. Oh, I know. Looks like it's five o'clock. Who we got? Chris, I think he got a quorum. You know, I don't. I, for some reason, don't have a full page of people here. Is Josh on here and Daphne? Good, Daphne and, and and Josh are not here yet. Um, okay. But you can you can scroll it, Chris. I know I am scrolling it. The other thing is, if you click on the participants, at the very top, there's a search, and you can yeah. search for people. Yeah, I know. I've got a new, I've got a new um, tablet here, so... Okay. All right. Wait. Yeah, it, it's I'm on a tablet. It's a little harder than on a regular computer. Yeah, Josh is in the waiting room. <laughs> That's what it says. We'll let him in. Good idea. <clears throat> and I don't know if Daphne, I don't recall if she sent me anything. Well, let's. We can get started. So sure. um, I'd like to call this meeting to order at 501. And you know what, Mary, you're going to have to hold for a second. I don't have that script with me. Hold on. Okay. Sorry about that. All righty. All right. I would like to call to order the Public Safety Commission regular meeting of November 2nd, 2022. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate the Zoom meeting process. Commissioners and city staff are participating from remote locations, and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to sign up to speak or on particular items or the tab to watch the meeting. You will only be able to speak during the meeting. If you sign up to speak before an item is called and, and, I'm present, and are present in the Zoom meeting. So please make sure you visit mal malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. Commissioners, if you have comments to make during the meeting, please raise your hand and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. And you would think I would have that memorized by now, wouldn't you? Um, call to order, Mary. Or roll call. Call. Sure. Commissioner you. Gibbs. Present. Commissioner Spiegel. Here. Vice Chair Stewart. Here. Chair Frost. Here. Has Commissioner Anit joined us? I don't believe so. You do have a quorum. And we also have ex officio member Woodworth here, I believe. Present. Thank you. We have a volunteer to sing the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I can't remember who sang it last time. Somebody want to step up there? All right, I'll do it. Okay. I'll, I'll do it there, Chris, if you want. Go ahead. Okay, everybody rise, please. Place your hand over your heart. 
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Gabe. <laughs> approval of the agenda. Do I hear a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. That is Keegan. Thank Keegan. You. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Josh. Thank you. Okay, Mary, Commissioner Gibbs. Oh, nope, can I call it? I got to call it first. Uh, Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. Commissioner Spiegel? Yes. Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Chair Frost? Yes. Motion carries. Mary, report on posting of the agenda. The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on October 26, 2022, with the amended agenda posted on October 28, 2022. Thank you. No ceremonial presentation, so written oral communication to the public and commissioners. Uh, do we have any uh, communications from the public? We do. We have one speaker signed up, Kushi Patel. All right. And I have a note here from Alicia Peak that she's trying to get into the Zoom meeting on her phone and she can't do it. So I'm going to oh. try to send her the link unless you want to do it, Mary. I, uh, I only have an email for her, Chris. So if you can try to send it to her, I'll respond to an email she sent me. But Mr. Patel can go ahead and speak. Yeah, first. go ahead. Um, hi, I'm Kushi. I'm a oh. student at Cal Poly, Cal Poly Pomona. Um, I have a question regarding to Public Safety Commission. Since this is my first time attending Public Safety Commission meeting, can you please elaborate what Department of Public Safety does to keep campus safe? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Ms. Patel, go ahead. You have three minutes to speak. So you can, they, they can't respond to you until the next till the next item. So go ahead and ask your questions um, and then they'll already, respond to you. I have already asked the question that, oh. can you please elaborate what Department of Public Safety does to keep campus safety? Okay. Well, I I think I've lost you. I got you. Oh. Sorry about that. I I bumped it too many times. That's the only speaker we have, so we can move on to the next. If somebody, um, either from staff, can probably respond to that speaker's question. All right, and Mary, I've sent the link to Alicia, so when she contacts you, we'll get back to her. She's been trying okay. for half an hour. To Chris, it looks like she's in the meeting. Is she? Mary, uh, this is Doug. Could you ask uh, Miss? Tell if she could clarify what she said about keeping. I wasn't sure what she said was safe. I think she said campus safety. Campus safety. Okay. Campus. Yes. Can we clarify with Miss Patel if, if she's discussing um, Malibu High School or Pepperdine or what which campus specifically? Um, I'm talking about Malibu uh, Malibu City. Like what? Service this department safety provide. So basically, you're asking for what the public safety office, the public safety department within the city is responsible for? Yeah. Okay. And I'm happy to answer that whenever it's the appropriate time. Why don't we go ahead and hear from Ms. Peak first okay. so we can get our public speakers done and then you can do that under staff updates. Okay. Lisa, can you hear us? I can hear you, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Alicia Peak. Um, I am speaking to you tonight as a commissioner for Parks and Rec, as well as um, a mother of three children and longtime Malibu resident. I am beyond concerned about the safety that is happening at the Bluffs Park. 
Um, I do not see the sheriffs being at all helpful. I have called them many times and they come here and they do nothing. I am very, very worried that we are at the brink of something very serious happening. There are a lot of children that are here from three o'clock on. Um, and I really think it is prudent of us to get either hire full-time security for the Bluffs Park or a full-time ranger. But the sheriffs are not helpful to the situation that is happening at Bluffs. Um, anyway, I'm just really concerned that we've kind of reached the precipice. I know that Legacy Park is also a very big issue, but my main concern at Bluffs is that there are lots of children here. And there are lots of children here for practices that are unsupervised. Um, anyway, it's in rec. I'm not, I feel like all of us need a joint meeting to kind of handle this situation. Um, but I really think we're at the point where we need full-time security outside of the sheriff's department. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Do we have, that's it on the, uh, do you, Susan, do you want to yes. address, or uh, Mary, should we wait on that or have Susan address it now? No, we, we have no other speakers, so we can go on now to item 2B, which is staff updates. And at that time, Susan can respond to the speakers. All right, um, I have a question for you. If if I wanted to po propose agendizing the issue at Bluffs Park, would I do it now? No, no to it? wait for do commissioner. commissioner wait for commissioner comments. Okay. All right. Fair Thank enough. Thank you. All right, Susan, you're up. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Kushi. Um, I, I hope I said your name right. I apologize if I didn't. Um, I understand your concern, but um, the, the city's public safety department doesn't have any direct jurisdiction over campus safety. However, we do work with the sheriff's department and the school district to assist in any way we can, which includes right now, we're in the middle of a request for proposals to do a comprehensive safety study at all the Malibu schools. Uh, if we want to start with a safety assessment to identify all the different areas that maybe there's room for improvement, um, identify what's working, what's not working. And then from that assessment, we will work with the district to make any improvements that are identified. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, and that's that. So, uh, also, part of my staff updates, I just wanted to let everyone know that two weeks ago, I submitted to the school district our proposal for a temporary impound yard to be placed at the high school uh, because Kerry Upton indicated that he is willing to make it work for us. And when I say willing to make it work, in the past, there was always a problem with having access to the school from Labor Day to Memorial Day. They really didn't want us there when school was in session, but he has since said that now he is willing to work something out so that we can use probably the upper parking lot, although he was looking at all the parking lots, the upper parking lot from Labor Day to Memorial Day. So I've submitted to him, he asked for a formal pr proposal. So I gave that to him. I'll be following up soon to see you know, where that's at, but uh, it sounds very hopeful. He seemed, very committed to making it work. So um, I also wanted to remind everybody that the city declared um, November 9th as our day of preparedness, which is our way of remembering the disaster of Woolsey fire and trying to do something productive. You know, it was a horrible disaster, but we want to you know, use it as an opportunity to remind everybody the vulnerability that we have to all disasters, not just fire. And we encourage everybody to take at least one step, just anything to be more prepared that day. If everybody could just do one thing, that would be great because no action is too small. It all adds up to make it, us more prepared. So I hope that all you commissioners and everyone listening We'll take at least one step, whatever it is, whether it's changing batteries in your in your uh, smoke detectors or checking on your food supplies, whatever it is that you need to do, do something and encourage your friends, your neighbors, um, everyone you interact with, uh, social media, encourage everybody to do at least one thing on that day um, in honor 
uh, as kind of a positive tribute to, you know, the, the devastation and then also um, the efforts. A lot of people went to great lengths, as we know, to save their homes and, and outside of the fire department. But the fire department did a lot too. Sheriff's department did a lot. But we want to recognize the work that everybody did that day. So anyways, that's all I got. Um, I don't know if Sarah or Luis have anything specific to add to that. Sure, I have a few updates. Uh, recently posted the monthly homeless outreach report from the people concerned. Uh, so September was a good month. This October's report should be coming in soon, but in the month of September, the people concerned were able to get eight people off the street. Uh, three people were permanently housed. One was temporarily housed and four were relocated, including one individual who uh, was notably a Woolsey fire victim. She was running a property here in Malibu and, uh, you know, thanks to the great work from the people concerned and a lot of the different housing uh, departments across LA County, they were able to uh, work in tandem with her and eventually get her placed and relocated to Santa Barbara where she's now living. So uh, thankfully they were able to get her the help that she needed and, and into something um, as quick as they could. Uh, so eight more folks off the street uh, in the month of September and October report is incoming. Um, the license plate reader cameras, uh, we just checked in with the vendor. Uh, those are expected to come sometime in November now, again, due to production delays. The great thing is that we've been uh, working with the Sheriff's Department and their team has already identified, um, as we have in, in this commission, the locations for where those cameras will be and they already have a plan in place so that once those cameras are uh, received on our end, uh, implementation should be quick and seamless. Thankfully, we've been able to work uh, successfully with them on that. So hopefully in the month of November, we're able to get those installed and running uh, so that we can improve the public safety uh, through those means. Uh, we also had an RFP uh, for interim shelter beds uh, for homelessness, especially now that we're in fire season. We of course wanna make sure that we're getting, uh, working proactively to keep the encampment, um, you know, encampments in the brush and the canyons and the hillsides um, as safe as possible and clear if possible. Uh, so that RFP went out and they closed uh, not long ago, and we will be taking that to city council for review and discussion uh, later this month. So uh, we'll see what comes from that, hopefully by the next uh, public safety commission meeting, and we'll have an update by then. Uh, the Knox box item, uh, so those emergency key systems that are recommended to be installed at private and gate, well, gated communities across the city, uh, working with Knox to develop some uh, educational material on that. So we'll have some community outreach material that the city will be putting together in partnership with them soon so that we'll start distributing and hopefully encouraging uh, community members across the city to install those to uh, improve shared response time. Uh, very similar to Calabasas who actually has an ordinance, but we'll be working uh, hand in hand with the Sheriff's Department uh, to get the word out and hopefully get more of those installed here in the city. Um, and again, just working proactively with the Sheriff's Department host and the outreach team to get um, keep our, our homeless fires down. Uh, we did have one early in October um, on uh, Malibu Canyon and uh, PCH in that vacant lot there. Very small fire with somebody who wasn't identified, but it was a new individual in town who started the fire and left not long after. So uh, that raises our count to four for the year, which is, is a big, uh, big uh, improvement from last year uh, where we had 23. So we were currently at four for the year. Uh, so it's a big improvement, but we still are keeping our eyes on the situation and working proactively with the sheriff's host and uh, the outreach team to keep those numbers where they are. Uh, but that's about it on my end. Thank you, Luis. Good job, you guys. Um, Gabe? Yes, good evening, everybody. Um, just wanna to touch on some weather items, update on Beacon Box and update on our hazardous uh, tree removal grant. Um, as we all know, we're in the peak fire season, the three months, October, November, December. Um, October passed, uh, not too much happened in the way of significant fire weather. Uh, we're heading into November. We've got some wind today, tonight. Uh, it's gonna turn northeasterly tomorrow night. Uh, humidities are gonna drop Friday. We'll have some brief elevated fire weather, but uh, nothing for red flags uh, as of yet. Uh, it looks like a stronger indication for some more significant rain Monday through Wednesday. So uh, things are looking good so far, and uh, let's, let's hope Mother Nature keeps cooperating 
Uh, an update on the fuel conditions. Um, some of you uh, commissioners have commented to me that just looking at the brush, it looks drier this year. And uh, that's a pretty good eye because you're correct. Uh, the, the new one came out a few days ago, live fuel moisture down to 56%. So that is, um, that's significant. The 60 is critical. The historic average is in the low 60s. And last year we got to about 56 or 57%. So I think it's part of the heating process we're going through, but um, it's the new norm to, to be this low. So uh, we're gonna keep an eye on that. Uh, the beacon boxes, our, our last meeting uh, got canceled. We were gonna update y'all on what was going on with that. Uh, a brief overview. The beacon boxes are for out of area fire resources that come into Malibu during big events that, um, and they're not familiar with the area. It's designed to help these individuals. That obviously the local agencies in all of Los Angeles County uh, has maps that are similar to the beacon box maps uh, on their apparatus and electronically. Uh, the city uh, determined to purchase 47 of them. Uh, they were a standard map that the uh, entrepreneur who's designed them was trying to sell us. And, and this is just a little background. Uh, Jerry Vandermeulen dealt with it initially, Chris Broussard dealt with it, and then Chris and I dealt with it. Uh, we weren't happy with the maps at all. Uh, they were based on um, uh, just not common sense and they weren't easy to read. We even brought them to a, a, a fire class where people who would be fire leaders on these large fires would be commanding a number of resources. And we showed it to them and asked what their input was and, and they, they gave it a big thumbs down. So through the course of a year, Chris and I had a number of spirited meetings with uh, Flame Mapper, that's the maker, and uh, we brought them around to designing maps that, that as they should be. Uh, Chief Smith was in on this. So we got all the maps done how we, we want them. Uh, and um, then we had to validate them all. It was a long process. Anyhow, we received 10 of them several months ago and eight of those uh, got up. The two that did not get up are both for one neighborhood, one neighborhood that has two entrances uh, they were all on board for putting them up initially. We, we corresponded quite a bit, and then it turned to radio silence, and, and we, we haven't gotten any response back. So I have some workarounds for that in the future. I've moved on. Uh, I'm going to try to get them in on some state property that's local to that neighborhood. Um, two weeks ago, we received the next 12 boxes, and of those boxes, we found homes for all of them. Today, with uh, Rob's help, and Travis from Public Works, we actually marked the homes that they're gonna have. So uh, the goal is to get the poles in the ground next week, but there may be a scheduling conflict. So at latest, it will be the week after next week that those 12 will go in. So to kind of recap that, the 22 that we have uh, in our hands will all be up ex uh, except for two in two weeks. Uh, I've requested the next eight. That's the batch that he wants to send. And I'm getting names for those and working on getting locations. Uh, I know at the last meeting, uh, Chairman or uh, Commissioner Stewart had some questions about, is there any standard with these? Is there any training? Are other fire departments coming from out of the state, out of the county, uh, going to know what they are and what to look for? And, and the answer is no, there is no national standard. This is a one-off. Uh, this one maker is making them. He sold them to Agora and Beverly Hills and to us. Uh, so I believe there's just three cities now. Uh, we're doing our part to meet with the local uh, Battalion 5 stations to show them the boxes, to show them what's inside, so that in a large incident, if they are in an area that's going to be impacted, they can direct those resources to open the boxes uh, I see it also as one of our responsibilities as a fire safety liaison to go to those areas in a large incident and ensure that the out of area units have the boxes. Um, so there's no training or awareness uh, outside of what we're going to show the local battalion five stations. So uh, Chairman Stewart, if you have any other questions at the end of this, uh, feel free to ask. Um, the 12 that we just received, they're going uh, from east to west. They're going uh, two on corral, one upper, one lower. 
one at Latigo, one at Sea Vista, Via Escondido, uh, Winding Way East, Winding Way West, Ramirez Canyon down low and Ramirez Canyon up high off of Keenan, uh, Zumeras and PCH, and Paradise Cove. So I hope that that kind of covers it all, if not um, all entertaining questions. I'd like to wrap up with the hazardous tree removal grant. As you have all uh, heard of it, uh, we got this last year through the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, and it was for $324,000. Uh, trees are expensive to remove. The, part, the program was pretty, uh, pretty successful. We got a lot of um, uh, customers, if you will. We still had about 20 people on the list when we ran out of money around May. I asked Susan what would be the odds of asking to extend the grant, ask for more money as opposed to writing a whole new grant. And she said, it only doesn't hurt to ask, right? So much to my surprise, uh, they were quite receptive to the idea and have given us more money than the original grant. So we got $350,000. We just got through all the bureaucratic hoops to start doing the work. Uh, and now I'm back with the tree contractor and we're scheduling um, uh, days to work. Uh, my intention is to take the 20 people that were on the list initially since they took that initiative and to stay with them. And next week we're gonna write up um, a public service announcement to the public to advertise this to, to get, start getting more people to sign up. So, um, that's it on the hazard tree grant. So are there any questions on any of that? No, but it's a, it's a great public service that we're able to perform here. I agree. I have, one for the, I have one for the beacon boxes. Is that, that appropriate to ask? Go, go ahead. Cool. Um, how are the, did the city pay for the beacon boxes? Were they, was it from grant money? And what were the costs per beacon boxes and are communities able to self-fund a beacon box if they wanted to? Uh, the total purchase for 47 boxes, and Susan can correct me if I'm wrong, is, is going to be somewhere in the vicinity of about $110,000. Yeah. Give or take a few thousand. A little over um, 2,000 a piece. Yeah. yeah. And, and the prices are going up. Uh, for anybody who goes in in the future and wants to buy, he's told me that the, the metals cost them more and the paints cost them more, the hardware's cost them more. Um, can a private area or can an area request one? Um, they certainly can, Keegan. It would be directly through a flame mapper who is the maker. Uh, we could certainly get involved and give our input because the company is still with the, the cities that have bought the maps now is buying the standard maps that he's putting in. And, and I would caution you to not buy those if that's, if that's what you're thinking. Um, I would like I to- just, I would I'd, like I'd heard people talk about them about, oh, I, we should get one for our thing. I just wanted to have a little bit more information that, you know, if, if they ask that again. So I appreciate, I appreciate the work on it. Yeah, and I think it's something that, that Susan could entertain if, if you see an area that's uh, not getting adequate coverage in the city from the boxes that, that I mean, I, I don't see why we wouldn't add in another box or two or, or a couple if there's a need for it. We could certainly yeah. have that conversation. Yeah, it was actually somewhere outside of the city recently that it asked, oh, okay. um, but yeah. Yeah, I've had, the, I've had a few Keegan outside of the area actually kind of uh, like up by Lake Malibu was asked a few times um, the only one that we have that is outside of the city limits is going up in this next round is Upper Corral. That's the only one that is outside the city boundaries. Cool. Great. Thank you. You bet. Uh, if I could ask a question about the beacon box as well, Gabe. Um, by the way, thank you for the information on, the, uh, on the, how you get this uh, information out to the other fire departments. Um, Take Latigo, for example, how far up Latigo are you going? Because at some point the city limits stop, but yet the firefighters may need to go further. Just wondering, does it go all the way to Canaan or how far do you go? That's a great question. So we're not just going to the city limits because that really doesn't make sense. Um, we know that the farther up we go the canyons, generally there are less homes, but Latigo is a good example, Doug. We, we uh, 
I can't tell you exactly where it ties in. It doesn't tie in uh, as, as far as we just mentioned, but all of the canyons go well beyond the city limits. Okay. Right. Well beyond. Matter of fact, uh, I had to ask to, to extend a couple of those that I thought were extremely important. I believe that was actually on Latigo um, that are very fire vulnerable that I said that just doesn't make sense to, to not include this one neighborhood. So um, I, I'll be glad to share them with you too. I mean, I, I tell everybody, you want to see these maps, I'll, I'll bring them to your house. I'll, uh, you come by city hall, whatever, because I think everybody should know what's on them. Very good. By the way, uh, Keegan, one comment is somebody just out of town. Uh, keeping those maps up to date and the thumb drives up to date is something that they've got to pay attention to. You just can't put the box up and lock it, I think. I, I'll defer to Gabe on it, but that would be my impression. Yeah, I think with the updates, um, you know, the thought was that there's not a lot of expansion in the city of Malibu and, and just outside of the city. I don't think we really have a plan in place for adding neighborhoods. I mean, I think if there's areas where a, po a few pockets of homes get put in, that's not going to be a big factor in the outcome. But if you look at a fast growth area, um, you know, not in Malibu, say somewhere in Ventura County or Santa Clarita Valley is a good example. I mean, th those areas are grow, they grow like weeds, right? And it's critical that you update the maps. But if, if we're talking a, a home here, two homes there, three homes there, um, I, I don't think that's necessary because the maps aren't the ultimate answer. The, the, uh, the leaders that go into these areas uh, on a fire, we call them structure protection groups. And so they, they're gonna go in there and they're gonna drive the whole area of, of their responsibility. And they're gonna have their own maps and, and they're, they're gonna know where the homes are. The, these are a, a nice to have, but not a need to have. And just a few homes aren't gonna make a big difference. Okay, can I ask that we wrap this up? We've gone way over just a staff update on this item. If you wanna bring an item back on a future agenda to really go over the maps and everything, we can, we can do that, but we need to wrap this conversation up. Sure, that's all I have to say, yeah. All right, Mr. Rob DeBow. I mean, I don't know how I can top that. I mean, that was like, an, I mean, that was long, <laughs> um, but um, good evening, commissioners. Um, good to see everybody. Uh, a few things that I wanted to kind of uh, give, give the commission an update on. Um, uh, um, as Gabe mentioned, we, we have some high winds coming up next uh, today and tomorrow. We have our, we have some maintenance crews on standby just in case something happens out there. So uh, we have everything ready to go with that. Um, another thing that popped up uh, this week was there was some uh, um, there was uh, we were just given notice that there were some small um, tripping hazards over there by Gray Fox and Fernhill by the school um, Public Works maintenance crew is going to go out there in next week and actually do some work out there to repair some of the. Um, tripping hazard that is located in, in the, uh, the parkway. Um, the sidewalk has been lifted by a bunch of trees that are out there that are causing some issues out there. We're also having an arborist go out there and make some recommendations on those trees, see if actually we need to actually remove the trees to, um, in order to, to solve the, the um, issues with the roots causing problems with the sidewalk. So kind of more on that coming. And kind of with that, um, I think the only thing that I wanted to mention too is I, I've had um, a series of conversations with Caltrans about um, um, adding bicycle safety features on PCH and specifically um, westbound from Malibu Canyon Road and going out of the city limits. Um, we're, we're in constant communication and developing some strategies on how to improve safety within uh, for cyclists along that area. And uh, lastly, um, this probably will pique Doug's um, attention it, is that yeah, I have been in conversation with Caltrans maintenance crews, making sure all their battery backup systems are up and running on all their signals. Um, they have reached out to me and they have verified that everything's up and running. Um, so we'll, I'm, I'm hopeful 
but I'm optimistic and see and make sure that we have that going. Um, with that, I'll be available for questions. Generators on standby? Sam, standing by. <laughs> that makes us all happy. There we go. If there's no questions, I am going to move to Commissioner Comments. I'm going to start with Brent. Unmute. There we go. Yep, we go. I just did. Hey, everybody. It's great to see everyone tonight. Uh, I've got um, a couple of different things, but first of all, I just want to make sure everybody knows that this last Sunday was Keegan's birthday. <laughs> you know, please. Yeah, I know. We can maybe sing happy birthday at a future date, but happy birthday, Keegan. Um, some interesting things that have happened since our last meeting on October 4th. I don't know, Chris, you were there, Keegan, you were there. We had a, an excellent meeting with um, LA County Fire Chief Smith, really helping to lead the way along with Megan Courier. Um, and we met with Chief Maroney and several of the other senior chiefs and also chiefs from Cal Fire. And I'm pleased to let you know, as you're aware, as we come up on this anniversary date of the Woolsey Fire, we've been working on the community brigade concept for well over three, almost four years now. And Chief Maroney has approved us to continue to the next step, which is working on some of now the final documentation, memorandum of understanding and other legal documents that we're um, gonna be working with LA County Fire to uh, try to gain agreement on. So we were extremely pleased and, and I just wanna thank everyone for their tremendous work and effort, but especially Chief Smith and Megan for what they did to help carry this uh, across the line so we could uh, move to where we are now. So um, I will keep everyone apprised as to where we are. And as we get through this next process uh, over the next month or two, um, second thing I want to talk about briefly in regards to fire safety and preparedness, uh, an event that I know uh, Keegan and I were both at, and of course, Chief Smith and Megan, uh, and that was we were delighted to be invited up to see a demonstration of some of the rapid response uh, capabilities of the Chinook helicopters up at Bravo 69. And it was um, an incredibly impressive event. Uh, where they had three helicopters operating, three or four, I can't remember, but the, the large double-bladed Chinooks that can carry about 3,000 gallons of water, um, can fly in actually higher uh, wind condition than many other helicopters, extremely accurate uh, with computer control dropping mechanisms, um, can run day and night. But in essence, this is a real game changer as far as the ability of LA County Fire uh, and this rapid response force to be able to address uh, a number of elements of wildland fires. And it was very impressive. Um, I will say that we had some conversations separately with the company that leases that equipment and um, they're willing potentially to do a demonstration of that equipment operating in Malibu, maybe something um, off of Zuma or another location. So I hope to have those future discussions. I think it would be a pretty exciting thing to do to get a lot of our community to understand this capability exists. And in turn, it's a responsibility on our citizens and our residents to take actions as well. So the fire department's doing its part and we need to do our part in hardening our homes and doing everything that Susan was talking about and Gabe was talking about in uh, this time frame to be, be prepared. So I think that's pretty important. Um, so those are the uh, the couple of main things I wanted to get across today. So, Chris, back to you. Thank you, Brent. And uh, yeah, big shout out to Drew Smith for all that he's done. He and Megan, I agree. And Keegan, birthday boy. Keegan, you're up. I didn't really do whole, anything, so <laughs> I appreciate that. Though <laughs> it is my it was my birthday, dog. Um, I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, Regarding Susan's comment around the anniversary of Woolsey, um, I wouldn't be part of this commission. I mean, that that event totally changed the direction of a, a big part of my life. And uh, I only hope to continue our dedication to changing things and doing things better for the future. So thank you for all your involvement and in continuing to do stuff and uh, onwards and upwards. Thank you. 
Thank you, Keegan. Josh. Thank you, Keegan. Happy birthday. Thank you, Brent, for uh, all your hard work on this stuff. That's so, so awesome that we're making progress with the brigades. And thank you, Chief Smith, for everything that you're doing, working with us. I think that's awesome, man. It's, that's really some, some huge news. And I hope the community really appreciates um, all the hard work everybody's put in. Um, I want to thank Alicia for speaking out on the, the parks. Um, that's been something that I've been hearing too, is just kind of riffraff and making some parents and some kids feel unsafe. Um, even today I saw kind of, I don't, I don't want to call it a homeless party, but there, there was a party right at the entrance on, to Legacy Park. Um, there were some guys there drinking a bunch of beers, you know, drinking hard alcohol, kind of having a good old jolly time, but it was kind of preventing, there was right at the entrance, preventing people from, uh, from getting in there. And it was, it was kind of, I didn't, I didn't really see it as an unsafe situation, but it was, it's kind of a bummer to see that, uh, you know, families couldn't enjoy that wonderful park because they were blocking the entrance. It's just, just kind of sucks. Um, you know, over the last uh, couple months, you know, I've, you know, recognizing that we've made a lot of progress on the, the, the fire safety stuff. I think we've had done a tremendous job over the last four years of um, stepping up our game at the city. But one thing that I've noticed we've kind of gotten away from is overall regional um, disaster preparedness, you know, earthquake type stuff. And uh, I reached out to a good friend of mine, um, Oliver Slosser, longtime local out here. Um, he works at Los Virginis. And he uh, he's in charge of all their new uh, water projects. And I don't know if anyone knows, but District 29 and Los Virginis are going to be hooking up their lines together um, up Ensenal. I think that's pretty cool. And he explained to me that in the event that um, if District 29 loses its supply or Malibu loses its supply to um, to us through District 29, if, the, if their pipes fail, Los Virginia's water district may or may not have the ability to reverse pump some of their reserve water into our tanks so that we could continue to survive. But I think, um, you know, moving forward, I would like to um, have agenda items, you know, more focused on kind of longer term um, emergency water resources for our residents. Um, so I don't know if how, how we go about putting that on the agenda, but I, I definitely would like to um, start focusing on that as well, as well as keep the ball rolling on our uh, fire safety, because that's definitely a priority. Um, let's see what else I have. Um, over the last few days, there's been, I've had some complaints about the Nixle notifications, um, just kind of not really working that well, not coming in timely with accurate information. Susan, can you kind of explain to me and maybe the public who may be watching just the process of which a Nixle notification, you know, from A to A to Z, how, how that goes out? Sure. And it really depends if you're talking about during working hours or non-working hours. So during working hours, and staff is readily available. Uh, what happens is we'll get a notice from Lost Hills or another source. And pretty quickly, one of the staff members who is trained on doing it will chime in via email because we'll, we'll all get it on the email. And they'll say, I got it. And they post it. Now, if that information is incorrect, that it, we don't double check the information. We just post the information that's provided to us. And there have been times when the information was incorrect that we got from the sheriff's department, and then we've had to correct it. Um, now, during non-working hours, it's a little bit trickier because again, <laughs> not working hours, but we do regularly um, identify people who will be sort of like say on call um, on the weekend, especially um, to be able to post. Now, on call does not mean that they're sitting at home staring at their phone. Just means they're supposed to keep an eye on their phone and they should, you know, as soon as possible, if they get a notice, you know, handle it. Occasionally it takes a little bit longer 
Because again, we're talking about people who are on their weekends and they do pay attention to their phones, but it could be a little bit delayed. Um, and again, same thing as working hours. Then it's also very dependent on whether or not the information we get is a complete and accurate because sometimes it's not even complete. Maybe the exact location is not specific enough. And then you got to make a phone call and you got to verify where on PCH because it'll sometimes it'll just be a little off where you have to verify, you know, where are you talking about before we can post it? Um, so that's how it works. And uh, I, I have to give you a heads up. We're, we're, we're looking at our alerting policy right now because it is very labor intensive and it takes up a lot of staff time. It probably, you probably, it's hard to believe, but it really is very disruptive to the work day on some days, not every day, but it can be very disruptive and time consuming. And we're trying to figure out ways to solve that and um, solve the problem of the non-working hour alerts as well. And alert proliferation, because we also hear that people are just being overloaded with too many alerts. So it just waters it down so that when we have something important to say, it, it gets lost. So anyways, um, there's probably more than I should have said. Mary probably would cut me off because we can talk about this later. But we are looking at our policy um, because it's it's not always as easy as it seems, bottom line. All right, maybe we should just give it to Frost. He's up day and night, and he knows everything. <laughs> but, so. Yeah. All right, well, I, I'm interested to see if there's if there's ways that we can tighten it up, but um, thank you very much for explaining it. Um, yeah. You know, uh, I don't know if this fits, and Mary can cut me off, but I would like to have a discussion of the safety issues on on um, Westward Road, um, I think that they need to be addressed prior to next summer. We addressed them last year, nothing happened. Same safety issues with the traffic jams are happening and we need to do something about it. So I don't know if that's an agendized item. Um, I, I, I don't I know brought, when we're gonna put it in. Josh, I did, that was brought up either last month or the prior month. Um, and I did talk to the city manager about it. Um, the thing is, is that the both the public safety and public works commissions made a recommendation to the council and the council chose to act in a different manner than what was recommended. And um, so we're looking at the possibility of having requesting that council ask those commissions to uh, look at it again and bring something back to them. But as of right now, it was assigned by the council to the two commissions who did what was assigned to them and it went back to council and council took action. And so it'll just be a matter of going back and saying, we made the recommendation last year, you did chose not to do it and here's what occurred. So we're- Are you, are you talking you know, about the, the road improvements meeting? Yeah. Well, I'm talking about like spe Whitford. specifically, you know, the issues at the Sunset Valet and the parking pass shack on the private property. Right. Josh, was... I'll, Josh I'll, I'll, I'll give you a call um, okay. either towards the end of the week or next week and we can kind of sit down. We can talk. We can kind of I'll, I'll get your input and see what we can do to kind of I think I know what you're talking about and, and I think I have an idea. So let me let's kind of strategize on, on that one. So I'll give you a call. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, my last, or well, two things, I guess. Uh, the cameras that are coming in, have those, do we need to okay them with Caltrans, Public Works? Are there going to be any additional hangups, red tape to throw those uh, license plate readers up? Or is it, are, are we all good to go? Like as soon as we get them, we're just tossing them up in the Sheriff's Department, you know, <laughs> has the software and we're good to go. That's a good question. I've asked that of the deputies. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure exactly what the status is on that. I don't know if Rob has more to say on that. I, I think it's just a simple encroachment permit. Um, and luckily enough, we're in the process of going out to bid to upgrade all all those signals out there anyway. And so I think that's kind of an easy thing to kind of get done and 
Good. And that's a that's an easy thing that can be done within the next for a couple of days, but right before they go up. So I don't think it's great. Okay. Kind of yeah. And then my last thing is it is kind of a question on the tow lot ad hoc. Am I allowed to ask a question about um, the permanent tow yard? Okay, I'll just go ahead and ask. So um, the I'm on the the tow yard ad hoc, and we we're tasked with finding locations for the permanent lot. As in addition to the looks like MHS is going well, but are we allowed to identify several properties so that the the city council could go and then consider each one indivi individually, or can we do we need to just say, hey, this is where we think it should go? Period. End of story. I I think I I would get a different options and then provide pros and cons on each of them and then provide the council what your guys' recommendation on the top one is. That would be my suggestion. All right. Well, thank you for listening to me ramble. Good yeah. to see you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Productive rambling. Uh, Doug. Well, I'll ramble. We'll see if it's as productive as Josh's. A <laughs> um, couple of things. Got a few questions to ask the staff. Um, Luis, I think the question Josh asked about, are we ready to go with the cameras is a good one, but I want to ask, do we have a map that you can share with us where they are going? I, I would think at this point we can identify exactly where they are and make sure we've got the encroachment permits or whatever in process. Um, is that available? You know, I have the locations. The deputies went out and they assessed it again. They took the recommendations that you provided and then went out and it's pretty close to exactly what you uh, recommended. And I think there might've been one change. I'd have to go back and look at it, but they have been identified. So we can start, you know, I can give that to Rob um, so we can look at the locations. Okay, one other thing about those, and I can tell you from experience at uh, our homeowners association, the cell service is always questionable. Uh, we have two cameras and we had two different providers uh, to make it work. So you might want to check and make sure the cell service coverage that you require is, is available where the cameras are going. Just a point to ponder. Um, next thing, zone app and signs for the evacuation zones. I saw something, uh, I think in the city manager's report or whatever, that we're now using zone finder or, or uh, a place to uh, pull up the information about which zone you're in. And that's going to be in the fire department's report at 5A yeah. if you can hold off on that. All right, fine. Then the other thing, please don't forget that uh, we'd like to have a request for signs on PCH um, uh, identifying which zone you're in. So I think Susan's got right. the plan for the. Uh, uh, yeah, the and order. if you recall, your recommendation even went a little further than that. So I've been kind of looking at that. I think it was Josh was saying that we might want to put signs in the neighborhoods as well. Yeah. Um, so I've been looking at the maps and what's on my plate is to identify the locations where we'd like to have them. And then I'm supposed to give them to uh, Arthur. <laughs> Arthur may not know this yet, but I was told to give to Arthur <laughs> to help me cost it out. Because it, for me to go to council, I have to be able to say where they're going to go and what it's going to cost. Okay. So that's what I'm working on. Okay. Um... Next thing I want to mention, I thought we had a, a red flag ordinance about people camping in public spaces at this time. And the reason I bring it up is we've got a person camping at Surfrider Beach, public place. And I mean, he's, he's more than visible. In fact, everybody that I've talked to says, what are you going to do about that person at Surfrider? <clears throat> um, yeah. I don't know. Is that being addressed or is that something we can? Well, here, first of all, we don't have a red flag right now. Um, but also in that ordinance, how that works is that the location where the people are have to be deemed by the local fire official to be a threat for, for the area. So that's a pretty high bar. So depending on the situation, like I would need to get to like the last time we did something like that, it was at Zuma Creek. Um, so there's a process to it. We can't just implement it. It has to be, you know, um, okay by Drew, basically. Chief Smith, sorry. Right. Um, um, I understand. Okay, that, that, that scratches my, my itch on that yeah. question. Um, one other thing I want to mention, Brent, Keegan, Chief Smith, 
this thing with the brigades is outstanding. Um, you know, we can't thank you enough for that. And it's come a long way since two or three years ago when we talked about Firefront following. And I believe Josh didn't mention it, but November 12th, you guys are going to have a demonstration at Malibu uh, West that we might want to have people go to uh, within Brown Act limits, of course. Um, <laughs> Then it brings me up to uh, one other thing. As many of you know, I've been having uh, meetings around the city for another reason. And I just want to mention some of the things that have come up as common items in the safety area. Excuse me, we cannot go into anything in related to your um, campaigning for It's not a campaign council. issue. This is about it, it doesn't. It, it's, it's coming out of a campaign thing, so we can't take any chance that you're getting the opportunity to use this as a forum. Okay. Sorry. Um, missing an opportunity. Let me, let me just say one thing about the brigades. I think one of the issues that uh, we need to do is make sure that's highly publicized. A lot of people, I think we've trained to stay behind and we didn't do it on purpose, but they look at the next fire and they say, gee, I'm gonna stay and fight the fire. We need to make sure they're aware that the brigades are there to cover while they're not there. And there's every reason for them to leave, not to stay. So I think that needs to be promoted. Uh, with that, I uh, fully agree with Alicia about uh, the parks issue. I think um, there needs to be better coverage for that. It may not be a, a sheriff's deputy we need, but we do need to have some kind of safety protection, especially for the uh, parks that are well populated like bluffs. Um, and one other topic uh, I mentioned to back up what Josh was saying or Keegan, I can't remember which one, we do need to expand the horizons uh, we've been working a lot on fire safety, which is very appropriate, but we do need to look at earthquake uh, preparation, and that's that's something we've kind of put behind us. The CERT team, I know, does a lot of work on getting the bins ready, but we probably need to address that uh, as part of our public safety activities. So with that, that's all I've got. Over to you, Chris. Thank you, Doug. Um, I've got a couple items here. I don't think anything's going to shock anybody um first of all i would i would first of all like to agendize the issue of safety at the bluffs um maybe we can craft something together to get that on a future agenda i i've been up there uh i was up there for the will smith party that came out on i guess instagram or TikTok or something at three o'clock and at four o'clock there was 300 people up there and while it wasn't really what I would call unsafe, you've got kids playing over on the field and a rather large amount of pot smoke floating around up there. Um, it's, not a, it's not a good look. It's not a good interaction. The sheriff was there. They really didn't really do anything because nobody had really complained about it, um, like a formal complaint. And the property that the people were on was not the, uh, it wasn't the Bluffs property. It was the uh, the gentleman who's developing up there it was his property. And apparently he was either not in touch with anybody or didn't know what was going on or whatever. But I agree with, um, I agree with Alicia's, um, take on it. I've been up there and I've seen things that I don't want to see up there. And I, what I really don't want to see is I don't want to see that area taken over. Um, you know, once you get a couple people in there and they decide that's a great place to hang out, then you got a couple more and then you got a few more. I know that Alicia got in sort of a scuffle up there with somebody that she was trying to move out of a, a no parking area and uh, it got a little nasty, so to speak. She had to call the sheriff um, and she knows to do that, but she shouldn't, I, I, I think we'd have to have either better patrol up there, private security or something. So can we craft somebody to agendize that for another meeting? Mary? Sure. Um, Maybe something along the lines of, um, we'd like to discuss the possibility of additional security at Bluffs Park or a system up there that brings them within a better safety protocol. Can you make something out of those words into something cool? That will be for Susan to do, not me. We've got it noted that you want something on an upcoming agenda. Okay. Do I need a second for asking to agendize that or? 
No, I think everybody everybody's comments led to a consensus on that. Okay. Okay, good. Um, second thing is, it's not the red flag that determines the, uh, the people living in the brush. It's the live fuel moisture. So um, red flag was mentioned, but it's live fuel moisture that determines. I think it's below 61 or 60, uh, Gabe. It's at uh, 63 is what we came up with, I believe. So it's anything below 63 and, and we can say you can't live in the brush. Yeah, we, we mentioned red flag uh, in there quite a bit because they go hand in hand, but and we, we wanted that to be the emphasis of it, but uh, it was decided in the end to go strictly off the live fuel moisture. So basically we're at that point. We've been there for five months, four and a half months. Have we really? Four and a half months? Wow, Probably. okay. All right, that's good to know. Um, next thing, and, and I actually, this isn't something that, has been discussed specifically, but one of the things that Sunset Restaurant is lacking is bollards on their outside eating area. And I don't know if it has to do with the angle of the tables in relation to bird view, but I don't believe it's real safe. So I think that needs to be looked at as well. And I'm not even sure that outside eating area was ever legally, uh, a permit was, was gained for that legally because it's definitely I mean, it's, you know, I mean, if your fork falls off your plate, it's going to be in the road. It's pretty dang close. So I think that's something that needs to be looked at. Um, on the brigades, uh, Brent and, uh, and Keegan, wonderful job. There was a lot of other people up there that were involved. Mikey, Matt Haynes, uh, Colin Drummond. Um, oh, gosh, I'm missing a couple of people, and I hate to miss them. Um, but one of the things that came out of it that Maroney, Chief Maroney brought up and is, is really important is the fact that doing an earthquake, these brigades will perform a very, very good service in the sense that they don't have evacuations and all of their resources with county fire are tied up within 15 minutes. And basically you're in your own neighborhood for the most part, and you can do a lot of good in that neighborhood just on your feet. And uh, so I think that, that, you know, we all focus on the fire issues and fire front following, and we've kind of gotten away from that a little bit, although it is still is a focus. But I think it's taking care of your own neighborhoods and really being a true community brigade is, is what that's going to be about. And that's how it's going to work out. And I think everybody's done a great job. I don't think if, Brent, if you hadn't held it together for four years, it would even be at this point. So good, good on you. Um, I'm having, uh, I, I'm getting... Uh, complaints about party valets that aren't dressed properly. And it's basically coming from some of the law enforcement in the area. Um, and I've seen it, I saw it over last weekend. Guys are you know, out there on the highway in black touch-like suits, parking cars or white parking cars, which is actually better, but I don't see anything in the way of, of signage or um, safety vests. And I know that that's something that's got to be followed up and it should be in their permits. And I'm guessing a lot of these people don't have permits. They just throw the party and let the chips fall where they may. But needless to say, it's, it's an issue out there. And I'm seeing about half the parties I see, the valets are not, you know, dressed for it. If that sounds right, kind of sounds weird. Um, racing at the West End of Malibu. I see very few deputies at the West End of Malibu. I'm out there running at 4.30 in the morning to Leo and back on a Sunday morning. I'm out there for six, seven, eight hours. Um, if I see one deputy, um, that's pretty good. Sometimes I see none, but I see a whole lot of racing going on. Um, I would estimate that two weekends ago, the two Ferraris I saw racing twice, same Ferraris, I would say in excess of 130. And, and over 100 is not uncommon. If you don't roll it over 100 out there with some of those car clubs coming out of the canyons, you'll get run over. So. I'd like to see somebody out there. I'd like to see some of those LIDAR radar guns, video guns that we bought for the Sheriff's Department out there with a flatbed or two. And it's got, that has got to be reeled in. I get complaints at the West End every weekend. It's mostly weekends, mostly in the morning. Also the 30 mile an hour zone at the bridge at Trancus. Um, I'm just as guilty as anybody. I turn out of Trancus. I forget that that's 30 miles an hour, even though it's marked. Um, but over last weekend on Saturday, I saw cars racing through there coming off the stoplight at Trancas. So we need some control at the West End. We need people up there. We need the motors up there. 
we need some of these radar guns up there to slow traffic down. Um, let me see what else. I had one more item on here. Well, I mean, I sound like a broken record. Um, RVs and complaints. Um, I had one guy at Zuma tell me, it doesn't matter. They don't enforce around here, so I'll just stay here. I had another guy tell me that none of the tickets are, uh, he, he can defend all of the tickets and none of them apply to him. And the law has been dropped. He can get as many tickets as he wants. He doesn't have to pay him because he's living in his motor home and that's his home and they can't tow his home. These are the answers I get from people. But the worst one I get is the fact that they say they're not going to do anything. So what does it matter? And that irritates me because if anyone knows me at all, they know that I spent one heck of a lot of time on this subject and it needs to be taken care of and dealt with. We have paid for this. We have paid to have this enforced. And uh, I know the story from day one. Doug knows the story from day one because we've dealt with it from day one. And since day one, we've, we've, we've had a turnover in personnel at all levels of this. No wonder nobody really remembers what happened on day one. So I want to see it enforced. And, and I'm getting to the point now where taking phone calls from people, I'm going to start recording them. And maybe at some point we can get a, a list, a time, and where these sites have been written, if they are being written. And also, I would like to see some kind of spreadsheet on where the tickets are being written, by whom, what time of day, and whatever. Um, we're spending an awful lot of money on this, and the highway hasn't gotten safer. And I'm not saying it's the fault of law enforcement. It's common everywhere. Everywhere you go, people drive like idiots. And I think we all see it. Um, it's irritating as heck. But when it's on your own main street, it hits even harder. And we've thrown money at it. We've hopefully, hopefully we're going to get somewhere soon with this. I'd like to see this enforcement immediately. I think it's been a year and a half now. And uh, I've said my piece. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, consent calendar. Do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? I'll make a motion, motion. to approve. I'll well, second. Mary? Shit. Was that Keegan that seconded it or Josh? Yeah, Keegan. Sorry. Thank you. I thought that. Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. Commissioner Spiegel? Yes. Chair Frost? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Mary. No old business, so let's go on to 5A. And that would be Susan. <laughs> All right, so here we are at our annual review of public safety services. Um, to present kind of an overview of the last year. So this is kind of a look back for the, the year of 2022. Um, we have representatives. So we have uh, from the fire department, we had Chief Drew Smith and Megan Crayer and Dan Murphy. Are you with the uh, lifeguards of the fire department? Is that right? That's correct. Lifeguard okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, and so he can speak to that. And then, of course, we have Dustin Carr to speak to the law enforcement side and Mark Russo. Uh, why don't we start with the, the fire department? Uh, Chief Drew Smith, why don't you go ahead and then we'll hand it over to the lifeguards. All right. Outstanding. Well, I just wanted to say, thank uh, the city of Malibu and all the support with the Public Safety Commission, especially uh, the fire safety liaisons. And it's more than a fire safety liaison. It's definitely an all-risk environment. Um, I'll just give you an overview on, on uh, the statistical summary for August and September, and then I'll go into the annual report. So just for August and September, uh, it, was, it was pretty benign at average was what I saw was seven fires for the two months, medical calls at 397, had um, 78 advanced life support and 111 and we transport 189 patients, no hazmat calls, 10 hazardous conditions calls, 53 service calls, and for the two months, uh, 159 good intent calls. 
Uh, just the overview of the last year of the organization. We have been busy. Your fire family is doing good. We're highly engaged as everybody that's on this call knows uh, your division seven's level of engagement to support uh, what we want to have as a positive outcome in all kinds of emergencies. That's on the proactive pre-fire setting and during an emergency. Um, this is year 34 for me, and I've been your assistant chief for just over two and a half years, and I'm very honored to do that. And I appreciate everybody who I interact with on a regular basis. As you know that we're an all-risk organization, we number one focus is life safety, but with that comes the fire suppression component, any of the prevention component. Of course, you know our paramedic services, our public assistance calls that we go on to routinely and uh, residents or anybody calls 911 and we're there to make their life better. You know that we have a robust urban search and rescue that's also complemented with the Sheriff's Department urban search and rescue that they have from the Malibu search and rescue, which is a great combined asset for those over the side rescues and technical rescues. You know our Air and Wildland Division, how robust that is. It's the largest in the nation for one organization to own their wildland workforce from air and ground resources. Of course, our hazardous materials. And we have a very, um, as we talked about with our community component in one of the, the outreach and the public education that we've done within the Santa Monica Mountains and especially Malibu because we understand the gravity of it and we're here to be part of the solution. The city of Malibu, four stations that we have there, we have a total of 51 firefighters on duty um, throughout the battalion that we have a battalion chief with those 12 stations and two fire camps. So we're very robust to support the city of Malibu and the surrounding areas. We also have a very um, complimentary workforce with our partners and that in the city of Los Angeles and also the Ventura County Fire Department that they don't ask any questions when we ask for their help they send them and vice versa. We support uh, those two organizations uh, very well. We're also complimented with MRCA that has a small contingent of a wildland workforce, also the National Park Service. So there's a lot of responsibilities within the local lands, the federal lands and the state lands that we're sensitive to. And the dynamics, depending on what type of emergency is in, one of those areas, depending on whose land ownership it is, has different uh, potential environmental concerns that we're uh, very cognizant of. Looking at the uh, averages for total responses is we're looking at 3,376 total responses. So if you look at 281 calls a month, that's pretty busy for the four fire stations that are within the city of Malibu. I can say if I had the opportunity or if we could go somewhere with this, it would be actually to, I would grow within the coastal area an additional three fire stations if we had the ability to do that for the customer service delivery. So our firefighters do an outstanding job every day based upon the natures of emergencies. As you know, our call volume within the County of Los Angeles and nationwide for your law and fire is increasing significantly. We had uh, 45 fires um, within the year. And so some of them are small and most of them are. We had one of significance that I can talk about, which was the, the tuna fire. And that was in Tuna Canyon. It was a homeless encampment fire and we kept it small. It was approximately four acres, close to five acres. Uh, on a routine day, uh, westerly wind, topography dominated, and it was the way that we have our strategic locations with our air assets, the water delivery is very quick on that turnaround, and we had optimal weather uh, for our air resources. We had challenging terrain for our ground resources based upon its, its location. Our regional 
um, response to wildland fires. As you know, we have our super scoopers that are back. We also, which uh, was talked about as a quick reaction force, which is with Orange County Fire, Los Angeles County Fire, and Ventura County Fire on the Chinook helicopters for those Chinook helicopters to be that quick reaction force, also with a helicopter coordinator platform to manage that rotor wing aircraft on a wildland fire. So when we have a wildland fire, we don't have any tiered dispatching. We don't ramp anything down. We only gauge it up based upon the need. So for us to hit the big red button, you get the big red army. And so that being the Los Angeles County Fire Department with our ability to flex and exercise those resources, the only caveat to that is it may not be the only fire in town. And the Woolsey fire was mentioned. What have we done and where are we going with based upon uh, coming up on the anniversary of the Woolsey fire? We have done a lot. And even before the Woolsey fire, we were doing a lot. So remember for the Woolsey fire, and I'll just use some averages, 14 mile wild, wide fire front evacuating a quarter of a million people. And I've said this before, nowhere else in American fire history has that been done. And looking at the wildfire risk, we take it very serious. The We have conducted, and some of you have been involved in this, you saw the demonstration we did at 69 Bravo a uh, couple days ago. So that was our third one that we've hosted. Uh, with Los Angeles County Fire Department, also with a partnership with Lost Hill Sheriff Station, we have been hand in hand with very robust uh, workshops. We're in the middle of one now. And this one that we're doing now is with Office of Emergency Management, Lost Hill Sheriff Station with the leadership of Captain C2 and myself and what um, I'll speak for Los Angeles County Fire Department. I'll even speak for law. We've brought our leadership out to a classroom setting for four hours in the morning. And then we go on a staff ride and we go and we tour the Malibus at different, what we call drop points and we talk. So we're doing all our chief officers, which we have an annual workshop, but with the success that Captain C2 and I have had with other workshops that we've done this year, um, we felt it was very important for her to bring her leadership at the sergeant level and above to participate. So um, we even have more of a relationship and bond on a wild land incident. So the first one we did was um, November 1st, and we have the next one is going to be on Monday the 7th. So we have close to 80 people in caravans stopping through designated areas within the Santa Monica Mountains uh, to look, walk and talk and talk about best practice and the what if to be ahead of the fire game, if you will, when Mother Nature is angry and we're faced to having to make some big decisions to make people very uncomfortable. The brigade program. Um, has evolved. So I want to thank, uh, boy, uh, there's a lot of people to thank. Uh, Brent, thank you. Keegan, Chris, uh, Frost, for all the engagement with this. It has been a long road, but it is going to be highly successful for us once we get um, embedded to start this evolving public safety endeavor. And it was mentioned about wildfire, but it's also was mentioned about other all risk components within the brigades that can be utilized. So we're going to look at it as a workforce. We're going to look at it as a workforce, just like any other tool we have in our toolbox. How do we implement that for the right task at the right time? And it's going to be coordinated and managed through an incident command organization that's set up for an incident and be utilized um, for whatever the best fit is. And I've said this before, we have professional firefighters, we have professional law enforcement individuals, but not all of them get to do the fun work. There's work that we have to do that there's a need. So 
Um, we don't know what that fit is. It might be a fire suppression mop-up endeavor on a fire front following. It might be a logistical support endeavor. It might be a damage assessment component. It might be a resident welfare check component. There's so many different avenues we can go down with a dedicated workforce that knows the area for that intelligence to help us um, bring some incident stabilization to something. And this is going to be significantly helpful to the outreach of the community. And the communities want this, and we want this. And we're looking very forward to this. And once again, it's been a, a long, long road. You also mentioned uh, beacon boxes and mapping products. <clears throat> beacon boxes are not the silver bullet behind anything that we do. They are a supporting tool just like anything else. They um, have a place for an opportunity for outside resources to identify them and get maps. I can say that the technologies that we have today and compared to five years ago, 10 years ago, or even 20 years ago when we lived off of a seven and a half minute quadrant angle map, topography map, if you will, on uh, identification of what we need or a Thomas, what was called a Thomas Brothers, now it's Thomas Guide has changed when we have a Venza map products, moving map products, technologies that you don't need cell coverage with. Um, significantly enhances what our ability to use, but a lot of other fire agencies are very ahead of the game. And smaller organizations have more robust technology than we do. We have the local knowledge of, of the area, uh, but we also have a very complementary mapping products um, that show us move on a map that gives us within three clicks of the iPad different uh, sets of information, whether it be hydrants, streets, um, or fire history, all kinds of good stuff. So it's not a map issue. It's really when a fire comes or emergency comes, it's an infrastructure issue. It's a fire environment issue. It can be a weather environment issue. So the beacon boxes are good. However, just know that um, they are not the uh, all cure to all emergencies. It's just a supporting mechanism with a pre-identified location that there's resource information in there to help give uh, clarity or institutional knowledge of that working area with outside resources. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to Megan Courier because she has a lot more cooler stuff than I do to talk about. Well, I don't know about that, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I have a couple of things I want to give you guys uh, brief updates on. A couple ongoing projects that, uh, that we have some updated information since the uh, report was submitted. So the first is our NOAA weather alert radio program that we've been working on for the past few months. Um, I will be holding three more of the distribution events in the next couple of weeks. Uh, this Saturday, November 5th, I'll be at Fire Station 89 in Nagora Hills. Uh, Thursday, November 10th, I will be at Topanga Christian Church. And then on Saturday, November 12th, I will be in Malibu at Malibu City Hall. Um, so I do want to try to get the word out. I've, I've sent out a notice to anyone I sent out an email to anyone that has registered but not yet picked up their radio, which was a, a good proportion of the people. Um, for example, in Malibu, uh, I've distributed about 450 of these ra radios to Malibu residents, and there are 450 Malibu residents that have not yet picked theirs up. So um, about half and half, and I'm about halfway done with the allotment of radios that were originally received. So I've given out, out 2,000 out of 4,000. So. I'm hoping with uh, one last big push, we can get all of these radios out into the region. Um, the next thing I wanted to update you guys about is, has, was mentioned earlier in the meeting, is the um, evacuation zones and zone haven. Um, I would like to share my screen quickly. I think I have that capability while we talk about this. All right, one more. Can you see that?
There you go. Now yeah. you're live, Megan. You're looking. Hey, you're good. Looking great. Got it. Okay. All right. So basically, the evacuation zone creation process is a countywide initiative. Um, LA County OEM. Hold on. Let me hide these. So LA County OEM contracted with an, an outside vendor called Zone Haven, and we use their platform to uh, help create and help create and um, host these zones and fire sheriff, OEM, city staff, everyone, we all work together to uh, create the most effective zones possible. And so you can see on, on the screen, um, this, is, this is what went live. The evacuation zones went live in the Santa Monica Mountain region on October 25th. And they are viewable to the public on this website, community.zonehaven.com. So basically now that they're alive, the entire group, OEM, fire, sheriff, the cities, we all released a joint press release and we're now working on a um, coordinated know your zone campaign to try to get residents to, to learn what zone they're in. Um, and like I said, we're part, it's part of a larger countywide effort and it, it started in the very high fire hazard severity zone. So we are the very first area of LA County to go live but uh, the next areas will be the other very high fire hazard severity zones in the county. So we're division seven, division three is the Santa Clarita area and division five is the Antelope Valley area. So those are the next areas that should go live. And then eventually it will be, it will be rolled out hopefully across the entire county. Um, as you can see, the Malibu zones are pretty much exactly, virtually exactly the same as they were before because that work had already been done previously. We had worked with the city of Malibu and, and we had worked together to create these zones. So when we were presented with this, this zone haven platform, the, the zones in Malibu did not change very much. The only real difference is, is the names. So um, because eventually these zones will be countywide, we needed a, a better name naming convention system. So we started with Topanga, because um, Topanga were, was the first area that had evacuation zones already. And then we went down through um, Sunset Mesa and Malibu. So basically, as you can see, Topanga starts it off with uh, TOP, which stands for Topanga, and then U for unincorporated, and then 001 through 009. Then Sunset Mesa unincorporated 010. Then we move into Malibu, which is MALC 111 through MALC 114, and the C stands for city. So that's basically just a way to designate between the unincorporated areas and, and the cities. Um, and then the, the purpose of these zones, the, the pre-designated pre zones are, will absolutely help our incident commanders um, early, early in the initial attack in an incident um, to quickly determine evacuation areas rather than having to create them on the spot. Um, so as Chief Smith mentioned, we had our wildland uh, chief officer training uh, yesterday and we're going to have another round of it on Monday and this was part of the training is making all of our battalion chiefs and all of our all of our chiefs aware of zone haven and the capabilities and the fact that they will be able to use this in an incident um, the other benefit of it is that it a lot it gives us a one common reference point for the residents and for um public safety agencies. So basically these zones will be updated in real time. Zone status changes will be updated in real time. So for example, if Chief Smith calls for um, an evacuation order in, in Malibu C-113, um, we can go in on the back end and immediately change the color and change the status of the zone and let anyone who's in that zone know that um, their zone is being evacuated. And so Zone Haven itself is not a, a notification tool, but there is a system in place that will notify fire department, OEM. Um, I mean, we'll already know about it, but it will notify the cities, city staff that they need to send out their city notifications and then OEM will send out alert LAs. So it, it, it will help um, build redundancy in notifications and make sure that, that people know that they need to evacuate. Um, it will, I think it will also be beneficial for city staff because it will give staff somewhere to direct people when they have questions about their, their zones and whether they need to evacuate or not. Um, 
so for example, if there, if there is a, an, a large scale incident that requires evacuations and people are calling city hall or people are trying to go on the website, everyone can be directed to this one common reference point and we will all be on the same page and people can see what's happening in real time, um, which I think is, has been an issue on many incidents in the past that people feel like they're in the dark and they don't have information. Um, so hopefully this can help alleviate some of that. Um, and like I said, it, it, it'll bolster our existing alerts notifications um, and it, connecting with our literally in the city alerts and it will um, give us that common reference point. So what I'm gonna, I can show you if I zoom in. So like I said, it's, it's a continuous naming system. It goes from Topanga on, on the right and then it goes all the way around to Hidden Hills. And so Malibu is, is the 100 series. Um, here, I'll zoom out a little bit. Malibu is the 100 series, Westlake Village is the 200 series, uh, Gore Hills 300, Calabasas 400, and Hidden Hills 500. And then all of the incorporated are um, U and then zero uh, with the number. So you can go up to 100 if we ever need to make adjustments. But for Malibu, so the way that it works is, is a resident can open this page. They can, they can go to community.zonehaven.com and they can type in their address. So I'll type in the address of uh, Fire Station 70. And so they enter their address, they click on it, and it will highlight the zone and bring up a pin over their address so they can see what zone that they're in. And then um, there's some information about location like north of, south of, east of, west of. Um, we are in the process of adding more links and information and obviously, City staff, we can work with city staff to, to populate this with your guys' uh, Malibu city information. And then there's also this link that says subscribe to alerts, which directs to the readylacounty.gov website. And it links, it contains the links to all of the individual city notification systems. So basically it will direct people to sign up for Alert LA County. And then if they scroll down, they can go and um, register for the city of Malibu, right here, Malibu disaster mass notification. So it, it's a common reference point and it's a way to bring all of our alert notification systems together and to put everyone on the same page in the region. So if anybody has any questions about that, I can try to answer them. Megan, is this only a, uh internet uh, link or do you have an app for it as well there is no app it's it's just a, the site but you can access it obviously on your phone it converts well to to um mobile but it, it's not an app it's just a, a website at this time yeah i would encourage you to, to get an app for it just because so many people don't know how to plug in uh, websites on their phones I will suggest that to the company <laughs> and i i think that also we may try to do some sort of um, webinar training session where we can show people how they can bookmark the link because because once they get it bookmarked they don't need to type it in they can just you know click the the, the favorited page or the bookmark um, but but that is a suggestion that I can make to Zone Haven. I'd like to second Doug's suggestion. I agree. <laughs> yeah. So this is building and so. We don't own the software or any of the proprietaries to it. We can populate it with all the great stuff that we want to have people to have the information um, available to them. But um, Zone Haven is pretty easy to work with. And how that looks, we can talk to you because you're, you're not the first who has mentioned something since the whole world runs on an app uh, that uh, we can entertain that with them. Then I have a couple closers. Is there any more? Uh, well, in the meantime, I can also create like a bit.ly or something so it's easier for people to enter so we can mm -hmm. push that out. Anything else for Megan? Great. So um, as Captain Etcheberry talked about is where we're at with our live fuels and upcoming weather, potential Santa Ana, all that good stuff. Just know that as you've seen, anytime that we have something of significance, we send it out of our office with great information for that um, information sharing with those that are affected. 
And so I know that, of course, the city of Malibu gets those. So when we have a high risk day, um, we send that information out on a one sheet that I put together. And just looking at where we're at on the seasonal outlook. As we get into October 1st and we close out around Christmas, on average, we get eight red flags that are issued a season. Each one of those red flags routinely lasts three days. So we should have been two and a half to three into it already. So if you go on the law of averages, we should have five left. But then again, other things come into play. Sometimes when we get those red flags are issued, it's dependent upon whether we've had the, any significant or measurable rain. If we get this measurable rain, that'll help. It doesn't eliminate anything, but we will um, give that information on how we're looking. Also, you talked to live fuel moistures and the ordinance that's in place. Um, when we get these rains, and let's say hypothetically we get an inch to two inches of rain over the course of the next three weeks, your live fuel moistures in the uh, late fall to early winter just don't robustly spike. They will still stay um, relatively low because they need to survive the winter and they don't freeze to death with absorbing a lot of water. And just know on live fuels, you can have the same catastrophic fire if the live fuel moistures are 40% or they're 70%. When mother nature turns on the fan with relative humidity is less than 10% and wind speeds over 35 miles an hour. Any questions for me? Before I kick it off to my good friend, Dan Murphy, and you are privileged to have our LA County lifeguards, that's for sure. Uh, Chief, just a quick question. We've talked in the past about a potential third uh, paramedic unit for Malibu. And I go back and I'm gonna talk to Lieutenant Carr about this as well. We had an incident over Labor Day where we had all the beaches closed because there were so many people. And we also mm -hmm. had the chili cook-off going on. You know, if there was a, um, red flag event, we would bring resources, you would bring resources to try and staff up for the eventuality that might occur. And I'm just wondering if uh, a third paramedic unit on call to, to fill in, because we had so many people here in Malibu, you couldn't get up and down PCH. So I'm just wondering if there's any anything that we need to do from a, uh, a I'll call it a paramedic basis, but fire rescue uh, during these large uh, people events. So when we have large events, there's quite a few things that go into place on what type of um, emergency service that go on. So we have the ability to move resources, whether it be engine companies, paramedic squads, um, all that. So here's the thing to remember that you're thinking paramedics on a ground and um, paramedic squad we also remember you have something that other people don't. You have a paramedic aircraft sitting just above the city of Malibu. So you have that augmentation to have that air capabilities to land at Pepperdine right across from the Chili Cook offices. So, but we do have the ability to, based upon the need, to move any type of fire equipment uh, to, meet, to meet that need. But there's also a requirement for these big events, too, for them to have their own EMS component in place that relies on them um, as well. So we can work hand in hand with them, because what we find is people that do large events, um, sometimes they shortchange themselves or the public safety component by not having that in place. And so it falls upon us to where they're charging admittance, if you will, and they are a um, for-profit type of business, and they need to also provide a medical component when they have large gatherings. There's actually um, um, ordinance in place, so that is a requirement. But to make your um, question and answer longer, we have that ability to flex our paramedic resources for those large events. Any any uh, thought about permanently putting a third paramedic into Malibu or do you think two is all we're going to get for now? Um, there is. And uh, like I mentioned, earlier, I, I put in an additional two stations on the coast. One of those that I've talked to you before about is actually 
um, replacing fire station 88 so we can get truck company services there. We can have more of a larger facility to uh, house a, a truck company and, and an additional uh, paramedic squad um, for um, the coastal area because it does get uh, very busy um, routinely. And it's like I mentioned before, it's it's just getting busier. So it's it comes down to if we can afford it. And as you know, the city of Malibu is not a fee-for-service city. So we would have to look at that organizationally, how we could um, do that. Okay. The, um, also remember that, thank you, Mike, is that um, our lifeguards also have paramedics on the beach. So we have a paramedic component integrated with the organization with our lifeguards as well. Dan, if, hey, to remind me of that. If, if I can step in real quick too, is I'm, I'm I'm not sure if Doug, you know this as well, but say if there's two uh, medics in Malibu that are both on calls, often they'll do a move up, right? Drew, well, they'll move a, a medic from like 89s or something like that into Malibu or another place yeah. that um, nearby so that they're not, we're not too spread thin, so. Correct. And that happens quite routinely. And you probably don't even know that that happens a lot of the time when we're have two um, paramedic squads that are tied up going to UCLA or maybe they're going to Los Robles or maybe they're going to Oxnard to St. John's um, that we move um, inland resources to the coast. And then with those inland resources, we bring them out of the basin and, and move them. So basically we call it a surge and we um, put those additional resources so um, people don't go without. But you have to remember as well, you're hard to find an engine company that doesn't have paramedics on it. Because, uh, I mean, dang near all of us were paramedics at some time. So you have a high quality of uh, care for um, life safety services for sure and once again like uh dan was saying our lifeguards that do a phenomenal job that they have uh paramedic services in place as well very good to know good good answer and appreciate that very much that's sir anything else from the fireside we kick it over to chief murphy chief murphy are you uh appreciate it thank you everybody there you are. I am. All right. Um, from the lifeguard side, it was uh, a pretty typical year on our ends. I think uh, we finished up in the Malibu area with uh, just over about 27, uh, 2,700 ocean rescues, um, about 2,650 medical rescues uh, for the for the full year. Um, the summer was uh, a pretty typical summer for us. Some of the things that you're seeing from our operation, um, especially after the the Woolsey fire, um, as it seems like that's kind of been an impetus for a lot of transitions, is a little more flexibility um, from the lifeguard side in how we operate and what we do. Uh, for instance, uh, on every day in the Malibu area, you've got six uh, lifeguard units on uh uh, staggered 10 hour days covering the daylight hours as well as uh, a two person lifeguard rescue unit running a 24 hour crew with a, an additional captain. Uh, so there is a, a three person 24 hour team. Uh, we have our rescue boat, uh, which is staffed by a uh, uh, captain and a deck can uh, 10 hours a day and, and will extend in the summer for longer periods when necessary. You, you know, our seasonal towers will kind of uh, uh, fluctuate with the, the seasonal needs. But what we're also seeing now is the lifeguards transitioning into a little bit more um, more assistance into the, the city and the surrounding area, um, especially right now with the, the ambulance crunch that we're seeing. Um, we're starting to, to see some creative captains when they have patients that they need to move to uh, an LZ and an ambulance with a delayed ETA and no no other way to transport a patient. We're uh, calling for lifeguard uh, trucks to respond off the beach because we do have the big open bed in the back of the truck and we can safely secure a patient and uh, slowly move from uh, whatever the, the accident site is 
uh, in these critical traumas and, and get them to the landing zone and then uh, fly them to the trauma centers without waiting uh, 40 minutes or an hour for an ambulance to arrive when when the ambulance <clears throat> staffing is, is just uh, so overwhelmed as they are. Uh, you're also seeing the lifeguards uh, expand into the incident management side of things to kind of take some of that logistical uh, stress off of the, the broader fire department so that uh, the, the firefighters can stay on the line and we can do the kind of the behind the scenes stuff uh, in communications and logistics and planning. Uh, so we're seeing a lot more of our members kind of step into that and and uh, the the Woolsey fire was a big impetus for that where um, a lot of our folks kind of got press ganged into it and and now uh, are starting to really pursue those those paths. Um, the uh, seasonal staffing was uh, pretty typical. Uh, the seasonal activity was pretty typical for us. Um, uh, notable calls, the the big notable one was the, the swift water rescue of uh, about 40 people out of Leo Carrillo uh, just about a year ago. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, not so much from the lifeguard side, uh, available for any questions if you got them. Any questions out there? Go ahead, Josh. <clears throat> uh, Chief Murphy, thanks so much for, for everything you guys do. I'm a, I'm a huge lifeguard fan. I mean, I see these guys just working nonstop, especially the, the Zuma boys. But um, what, do you, what do you need from us? What, are there additional resources that we can help you with? Um, I mean, you've, you've more than earned it. So, I mean, I, I don't want to put you on the spot. Maybe you could come back. If there's something that the city of Malibu can do to make your lives better you, and um, kind of act as a little bit more force multiplier, you know, just let us know what we can do for you. So we're here. So just ask and we'll, and we'll do what we can. I appreciate it. It's, the city has been great partners and um, you know, it was, uh, and again, kind of, we've been partners for, for decades, um, but, but going back to Woolsey and, and seeing, how, uh, you know, the Zuma headquarters uh, kind of became a, a little satellite station for the city's emergency operations and, and the close relationship that's, that have come out of there. It's, uh, we certainly appreciate the partnership and we appreciate the support of the city. Um, uh, I think as far as uh, resources, um, there, there's always room for, there's always room for more. Um, we do have uh, paramedics on the sands. We do have a number of highly trained lifeguards, but what we uh, what we don't have, and, and among the ideas that have been kind of kicked around, is uh, a paramedic assessment unit. Um, in Hermosa Beach, what we do periodically is uh, when they have big events like the Hermosa Fair, is we'll upstaff with a uh, a side by side, like a, a we call it the QRV. It's a a side by side uh, vehicle, a little quad with uh, uh, two paramedics on it as an assessment unit, an ALS assessment that in areas where, um, you know, we, we find it difficult to get the squad to and, and Hermosa is its own little island with, with the one squad uh, in the area and then others have to respond from um, a couple cities away. But, uh, you know, just thinking about the, the situations on Zuma Beach, we've got 71s right there, but uh, um, an assessment QRV uh, for those augmented uh, heavy weekends, the July 4, the Labor Day, the Memorial Day, um, some stuff to kick around and, and just kind of, you know, thinking off the top of my head, uh, that would be uh, one place that I think um, we would, uh, I think it would benefit the public safety um, having that uh, ALS assessment right there that could kind of free up some of the other resources, but this is uh, big picture stuff that's above my level and, and I'm just kind of uh, shooting out some ideas. All right, well, we meet once a month, so. Come here. come back, visit us. We always like you know, here. Drew, Drew has his hand up. Oh, Drew, I, I have my hand up. So just a couple on what Chief Murphy says. So the QRVs, we also have four of those. So we it, within the division, let's say that you see that there's a need uh, for additional paramedic services. We talked about move up companies, how we can do that. But if you have 
an event and we do this quite routinely and I'll, I'll use uh, the city of West Hollywood for an example. They have a lot of events and we actually put an MOU in place with them and bill them for an augmented service. But then again, they go around and bill whoever is hosting that event. So let's just use Acme, Acme event services. And so then what the city of West Hollywood does is we don't directly bill Acme. We bill the city of West Hollywood, who then gets the cost recovery from Acme. So that is a potential that we could do. Also, if you have a concern, we can sit down and look at an MOU. If um, you're um, going to collect from Acme, that that can then, for those paramedic services, can uh, go back to us on an augmented workforce for that cost recovery because it's unfair for people to come into your city and do these big robust events that you don't get any cost recovery from because you're trying to keep the people that are within the city safe. And because one thing that we don't want to do is divert all of our service delivery to these events when you have people within the city that are just living their lives to not have the adequate response from us that they deserve. So we can talk to that at a later point in time as a group as well. That's really interesting for me, Drew. Uh, we've never really thought about that. Is that a possibility for Malibu seeing that we, I'm not, I'm not sure what the correct term is that we're not a paying, like we're not a paying city for the county fire or we're not contract, right? How would that we work? We're not. So you get pass, pass through monies on pass -through property money. tax. And so, so there is other cities that actually pay that are fee for service cities. Um, so we can do direct billing with them for that fee for service city, but the way to do it is through an MOU. If we need to do any augmented staffing um, that also you need to get the cost recovery from. Um, so there is, there is avenues to do that. It'll take a little legwork in on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the most painful. I'll put it at about a four. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for the reference. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that's definitely worth looking at. I'm not sure if Susan has any comments about it, but um, <clears throat> I can't think of any major events that have happened that there have been anything, you know, tragic happened at that would, would suck all resources to. But um, I think put potentially looking into requiring that as part of event planning in Malibu would be uh, really interesting. I think, um, I don't know, maybe we can agendize that sometime in the future, or have you come back or whoever the powers that be talk more yeah. about that. I mean, I think that was my only thought in listening to this is maybe reviewing what's required in a special event permit, especially for events with more than say, 300 people, you know, uh, based on the size. And we um, have that um, that's available that's uh, DHS mandated for uh, based upon the amount of participants that you're going to have, what's required. Mm -hmm. I think cities can even make it more mm -hmm. if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I can, I can see the advantage in this when you look at, uh, Take for instance, like maybe uh, like the World Surfing Championships in Huntington Beach, something like that that draws an enormous amount of people that are not only on the beach, in the water, and on the streets. And uh, you've got that flexibility to to move that um, that cart around easily. Well, what about uh, what about the triath what about the triathlon uh, Zuma? Yeah. What, what sort of augmented staffing do you guys require for that? Do they have to pay for fees, et cetera? They pay. They pay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. For, the, for the Zuma triathlon, um, they typically will hire additional lifeguards uh, and, and will put an additional 40 or 50 lifeguards on the beach uh, specific to their events. Uh, and then on top of it, they'll bring in uh, uh, their own private ambulance service, uh, but their, um, their ambulance service is really uh, stuck within the Zuma beach parking lot. So they're not covering Outside the, the parking lot, uh, they will have first aid tents set up throughout. But uh, as, as we've discussed uh, with their planners, when it becomes an ALS, while they do have paramedics and, in fact, doctors 
on site in the, the, the main event area at Zuma Beach in the parking lot. Uh, when we have the, the incidents that require ALS service, um, if it's on the course, on the, the, the bike course, it's typically going to be uh, county fire responding into it. And when we have them, um, even on the run course where uh, lifeguards get flagged down and, and we respond to it, uh, we're typically getting uh, Squad 71 to come in for that ALS service. And, and we had uh, an ALS transport um, this year at the Zuma Tri. And uh, pretty much, uh, I think every year we have at least one. Um, the previous year, I think there was a, a full arrest at the, the finish line that got flown out. Um, their medics were first on scene on that one, uh, the medics for the event, and, and they did a fine job, uh, but it was uh, the firehawk that flew the patient out of there. Uh, so they, they do rely on LA County Fire pretty heavily, and they do contract with the lifeguards for some of our services, uh, but they, um, they certainly get, uh, get more than, than what they pay for, and, and they, do, they do pay for their own uh, service on site, but they, uh, they get uh, quite a bit from us as well. You know, Dan, I was at the finish line um, when they had that arrest. And if you had had uh, the little vehicle down there, right there, had ALS right there, you would have gotten with the LZ a lot quicker than they did in their ambulance. Their ambulance got hung up in the cars on the road there because they had the parking lot closed for the LZ. So everybody was backed up. So you could have gotten right down the boardwalk like that. So just a, insight into it yeah probably interesting interesting um i like the idea i think it could become very useful in the right um circumstance absolutely i think Chief a lot of uh, ideas about how to make that happen if that's something that the city wants to go with um again it's it's something uh, above my level and it's a it's a chief smith kind of conversation and uh, yeah but we'd be happy to to support um whatever uh, you all come up with and decide. We'll carry that forward for sure. Thank you, Dan. Um, let's move to 5B. Okay, that we're not the... done. <laughs> we still need to let uh, Lieutenant Carr and uh, Mark Russo, VOPs speak. I actually thought Lieutenant Carr was the next one. Well, okay, I guess we can combine the two because technically they're two different reports. Okay. One is the annual report, one is the beach okay. team report. That's but if fine. you'd like, I mean, you can probably combine them. Or Dustin, you can just start with one and bleed right into the next. That's Yeah, that'd be good. Um, I, I've got the beach team on my uh, slide anyway. Um, I don't know if you guys are able to load the slides I submitted. Oh, so uh, good evening, commissioners. Um, I'll be giving the annual review for Malibu Lost Hill Stations for the city of Malibu. And uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, right, this is a comparison year over year crime. Now the crime statistics on the left are going to be for the entire year of 2021. The statistics on the right are year to date. This would be uh, as of September 30th of uh, this year. So looking at our crime statistics, we are on track this year to be lower than last year. This year we've seen decreases in robbery, aggravated assault, grand theft auto and arson. Uh, Non-aggravated assaults are also significantly down. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the statistic for uh, forcible rape on the part one, under the part one crimes, at least two of those can be attributed to the recently arrested predator from the Santa Monica College. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, this slide is one of two for comparison, uh, how Malibu is faring up against the other contracted cities within the Malibu Lost Hill Station primary area of jurisdiction. Right now, Malibu is doing outstanding. Um, as I highlighted before, there's a 56% reduction in grand theft auto, a 16% reduction in arson. Overall, part one crimes are down about a half percent when you told them. The uh, only increase we've been having is in uh, residential burglaries. As I explained on the uh, last city council meeting, um, our situation is a little bit different than uh, cities uh, on the other side of the Conejo Valley. Uh, when we're looking at the, our burglaries, some of our burg most of our burglaries are um, 
how, as I would explain it, um, would be a homeless person breaking into a house. They use a utility that turns into a burglary. Um, there were other situations where um, the, uh, members of our younger population would break into someone else's vacation home. They would party in it. Um, sometimes something would come up missing. That would be a burglary. And there were other situations where people were stealing from uh, homes being rebuilt from the Woosley fire. And uh, since those are residents, those would also be counted as a residential burglary. Um, there were no uh, significant high value losses in the city of Malibu as a result of these burglaries uh, to date. If we can go to the next slide. Um, again, um, this uh, just highlights how we fare up against the other contracted cities and um, on the last three uh, crime categories here. And I uh, just wanna say that uh, in comparison, uh, in general, Malibu is doing better. Again, we addressed the burglary issue, but that is also an issue in our other contracts to cities. And we have put more burglary patrols in place uh, to address this issue. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, I wanna talk about traffic now. Um, we've seen a, a notable increase in collisions. Um, however, fatal, uh, fatal collisions have seen a decrease. Um, right now, year to date total, we're looking at two last year, year to date, and this is ending August 30th. Um, and we had, uh, we had four, so we we were down about 50% on those, um, injury collisions are up and, uh, so private property collisions and DUI collisions as well. Um, we can go to the next slide and, uh, I want, I'll combine the beach team in with, uh, my presentation here. So year over year comparison. Uh, regarding the beach team, obviously uh, in 2021, we had 7,784 parking citations. There's a contrast with 2022 with 4,816. Um, again, there's in decreases as you go down the statistical line. And um, I'll explain a few of those, uh, so several reasons. Um, one, one of the big things is we had uh, several retirements of experienced people that were writing our tickets on the beach team. They normally work the beach team. And uh, just an example, some of them would write 30 to 50 parking citations each a shift. So they were, they were big producers and they have since retired and we're looking to replace personnel. We also had to train, we had a, obviously a, a rollover of personnel. We had to train new personnel on ATVs. The training on the ATVs takes time. Um, we had to farm out this training before. Uh, this year, we're solving this issue with sending deputies to the ATV uh, training class so they can train in house. So we won't. Uh, so next year, we'll be able to train it. It'll be cheaper, quicker, and we can get more deputies through the training program. Um, we also had issues hiring parking enforcement personnel. Um, they. We, we normally were able to hire many more. Um, and this year we had a lot of trouble hiring them. Uh, we have to get those park enforcement first personnel from other contract cities to come work for us. And again, there were some big issues in hi uh, hiring them. They were either um, already hired for other events or they were filling in staffing shortages at their own uh, units of assignment. Um, next year, though, we're going to try and look into pre-hiring parking control officers to get ahead of the game and uh, try to increase those parking sites as well. And then also this season was also shortened by two weeks um, as opposed to the previous seasons. Um, that, uh, that issue was made before I, I took over uh, Malibu, and I do believe uh, that it was like uh, pretty much done in line with the uh, contract for the beach team. And then lastly, I want to go over some wins if we can go to the next slide. And ju just some things that the, the uh, some wins the deputies have been uh, providing. Um, obviously, uh, we talked about earlier those uh, sexual assaults from um, Santa Monica College. Uh, Special Victims Bureau was able to apprehend Christopher Gridden for those two, those two sexual assaults that occurred. Um, it, on September 8th, very recently as well, they were able to arrest Abel Tello for a, an assault with a firearm that occurred in Malibu. That was on Los Flores and PCH. Um, that was a road rage incident. Deputies also arrested Dwayne Jones for assault with a knife after, after they engaged in a foot pursuit with him. Um, other successes we've had, uh, we partnered with the city and the host team 
obviously, the, you know, um, the city has been a wonderful partner in helping reduce the homelessness, and uh, we continue to look forward to partnering with them. Uh, the Summer Temporary Tow Yard was also a success. I, I wanted to mention that specifically. Uh, that made things a lot easier on, on uh, insofar as running the beach team and uh, getting people educated and uh, getting their vehicles back in a timely manner. Uh, beach team improvements were underway this year, like I mentioned before, with the training programs and stuff like that. Uh, we're going to have people uh, up, you know, many more people trained and uh, try to get everyone experienced uh, in uh, ticket writing as well. And then also, you know, we started coffee with the cop again. Uh, we did a lot of the first one on 928. We're going to try to do them quarterly, try to do more community outreach and um, help out in that wise. So. That, that'll end uh, my uh, year in review. Um, I try to be respectful of everyone's time, but I, I'm available to take questions. Chris, I've got my hand up if I can. Uh, I, I couldn't see it. I, I see it now, Doug, go ahead. It's yes. up here, it's up here. Lieutenant Carr, um, yes. on the parking citations, I'm always curious. We've got the VOPs out doing parking citations and your uh, beach team, you know, 7,000, 4,000, however many there are for the year. Where are they writing the, the tickets this, for, you know, 4,800? For, for which, I'm sorry? Where are they Did writing the tickets? Because, you know, I'm thinking that the VOPs are out. Are you talking about the CSOs as a beach team? Well, what? we have deputies writing parking citations. We also hire parking control officers. They go through the parking lots of the uh, beaches and enforce the parking laws there. Um, the LA County Code has a lot more uh, stringent parking uh, restrictions within that actual parking lot itself than would be, you know, along PCH. Okay, so this is inside the parking lot. It's like at Zuma Beach and it... Uh... In general, and I do believe they also enforce on PCH as well. Double parking, things like that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. This doesn't count the VOP numbers, right? This is... I don't think so. Yeah. I think these are beach team numbers. Okay. Thank you. I thought I saw Brent's hand go up. Nope. It's down. Okay. Um, Lieutenant, I have a question for you. Is there... Uh, were the, was the beach team using the electronic ticket writers this summer? Do you know? Can you find out? I can find out for you. Um, the, uh, I, I don't think the ticket writers were up and running at, during the beach team. Uh, and I'm not talking about the VOP ones either. I think the ones you guys recently purchased, the three. I don't think those were up and running yet, but I'll find out. I'll talk not to those. The, the ones that they, we give, we give five or six um Electronic ticket writers to the beach team at the beginning of summer. Those are the ones okay. I'm talking. About. Okay. And, yeah. and my question really relates to, um, you know, they can use that for writing anything: an ordinance on the beach, smoking on the beach, whatever. Um, I'm just curious how often and what they were being used for, because it's it's a cost to the city, and we're just curious if they're. I mean, if I was out there on the beach, I'd be using that thing rather than writing in a ticket book. Uh, it would be my go-to for sure. So if you can help us with that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I can certainly get back to you with that. All right. Uh, Josh, you have your hand up. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I just I just wanted to touch on something Lieutenant Carr said. And I, I'm I, I just I just something that I don't understand. So Malibu, essentially the whole idea of the beach team is to prevent issues on the beach, which which isn't our property becoming larger issues later in our community. I understand the drinking on the beach, et cetera, et cetera. If we're paying for the CS, for, for some of the parking uh, citations on um, county property, state property, wherever it is, how, how does that benefit the city of Malibu? This is an exorbitant cost. And I'm not sure that this this program. I mean, we're, we're going to have a new council coming up, so I, I don't I don't know how that election is going to go. But, um, you know, I I, I think that we're going to need to explain to city council why we're spending money ticketing cars that are inside um, the parking lots there at Zuma. Sure, I, I can I can look into seeing uh, you know how much of those fines are going to Malibu or or how that. Uh, 
particular program works and, and to see what kind of, if, there, if it's generating revenue for the city. Yeah, I mean, it's not, but, it's not just the revenue generation, it's the expenditure of, of capital being focused in inside, you know, the, the, the county parking lots that really, I don't see how a, you know, front license plate or expired tags or whatever has, I don't know how that benefits Malibu safety wise, but uh, I mean, that's why they pay you the big bucks to figure that out. Um, I think a lot of, you know, I, I, you know, one, one thing, you know, I just, you know, I, I, you know, I, I'm glad the, the Heathercliff lot look worked out for you. I'm really bummed out at the, at the number of cars that, that were towed. I mean, we were, I know, I understand that you weren't there to design the, the tow operation, but we, you know, we were expecting, you know, over a thousand cars and we got, you know, about 300. And every time I went by the, uh, the tow yard, there were trucks sitting there and there were a whole lot of real significant safety issues along, along our highway. And, uh, kind of, it kind of bums me out to, to hear that, oh, they might've just been inside Zuma parking lot giving tickets for, um, whatever, whatever it was that has no real safety impact on Malibu, but yet there's, there's cars, you know, blocking fire hydrants, blocking the roadway, blocking the roadway way is really scary to me because that's, that's where some significant stuff can happen. I understand. And, and the one thing to look at is if you, if you put aside the parking citations, if you look at the traffic citations, those are all done on PCH, the hazardous ones, the non-hazardous, those are, those are all done on PCH. Those are, those are would not, obviously those are moving violations. Mm -hmm. uh, those are people actively disobeying the law while driving. So. Okay. And my one, I have another question about, uh, you know, one thing that's, I mean, it sounds silly, but you know, glass on the beach that I saw, and I might've been reading this wrong one ticket out of, you know, more than a, about 1200 alcohol on the beach, you know, and it's, I glass on the beach. I mean, that, that can really ruin somebody's weekend. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know if that was being enforced or what, or we just got lucky and, the, and everybody was drinking Modelo's out of a can, you know, rather than, you know, nice bottles Corona, but I, I don't buy it. Um, so it, I, I, I don't know for sure. I could opine on that and say that uh, they probably got an alcohol on the beach citation instead of drinking out of a, you know, a glass uh, beer bottle or something like that. Um, you know, that, that, that would be, that would be my opinion on it probably is the deputies chose to uh, enforce the alcohol on the beach as opposed to the, uh, to the actual physical glass container on the beach. Uh, but that, like I said, that's just, that's me op opining at this point. So. Okay. I understand. Um, let me, let's come back to me. I, I'm sure I'm going to have something in a minute. I'm just trying to get organized. I see Doug has his hand up. Doug. Yeah, kind of a follow-up question. Um, you know, it's kind of like Josh, I'm sitting here contemplating this thing about parking lot uh, uh, enforcement. The actual number that we spend is around nine hundred thousand dollars for the beach team, and the yeah. only revenue that we know that we get from it is a share of the parking tax from the beach, which is about two hundred fifty thousand to three hundred thousand a year. So we've got a dividend of about six hundred thousand um, dollars, and like Josh just mentioned. If we're paying for parking enforcement, we don't get the tax, the ticket revenue, we're being hurt. And then the fact that the CSOs or whoever can write the 180s, for example, or other tickets are on the uh, beach parking area, we're, we're at a loss to be able to protect the citizens of Malibu. So I do think we need to figure out where the allocation of resources is going. Um, and obviously it's easy like shooting fish in a barrel to drive around the parking lot, but the issue for the rest of the city is uh, in the rest of the city. The other question I have for you, and I, I kind of gave you a heads up uh, last time around, uh, we canceled the meeting. Looking down the road a little bit at the future of uh, Malibu uh, with the sheriff substation as a possibility, how many arrests do we actually make in Malibu? And what, what does that do when, and I'm looking at the beach team, for example, 14 warrant arrests and 18 misdemeanor arrests, so that's 32 arrests. 
What does that do? Do they have to take those people to Lost Hills and we lose a patrol car or two deputies? Or um, it depends. Uh, if the warrant citable, they'll cite them. But if they, that's for example, their actual arrests uh, uh, where they have to go in custody, then yes, they have to transport them all the way to Malibu Lost Hill Station. So they have to go up the canyon and, and book them there. Okay, but well, what about the number of arrests versus Lost Hills? Are we the are we the preponderance of most of the arrests, or do you get so if I if you if you take all the uh, five cities and the county areas combined and and measure up Malibu against those, uh, Malibu right now counts for about thirty four percent of our arrests total as a station, so uh, just over a third. Uh, same thing for calls for service and reports. Those are right in line uh, uh, with the uh, the rest of uh, Lost Hills jurisdiction. So um, Malibu accounts pretty much for about a third of uh, a third of uh, everything that Malibu Lost Hills Station produces. Okay. All right. Thank you. By the way, I do think we need to take a harder look at the beach patrol uh, versus uh, serving the rest of the city. If they're if they're just getting fish in a barrel um, and not patrolling just the beach, and only patrolling the parking lot as opposed to just the beach uh, area. I think that's that's a concern. I think we're, we've got to address that. Well, I do, they, they do spend a significant time on the beach. Uh, that That is for sure. I think the parking lot, um, you know, is an, an additional thing that they do patrol, but they do spend a significant time on the beach. I, I can attest to that. I, I've reviewed their body-worn cameras and things like that. They spend a significant time on the beach, so. I, I, if I may chime in real quick too, is I remember last year when we went over this same data and we were also talking about budgeting stuff with how much we spend on the beach team. I was under the impression that we actually have a significant amount of deputies that have are assigned or have ability to be, go into a car and actually can patrol greater Malibu. Is that true? The deputies on the beach team do uh, for the most part have patrol vehicles. Um, they are mobile. They can go from beach to beach. They can go around. But generally, uh, you know, when you're assigned to the beach team, yeah, they can respond to any emergencies that are occurring in Malibu um, at any given time. Like I said, they are uh, for the equipped with patrol vehicles. Um, but generally, I mean, the uh, the goal is to patrol the beaches. So they, they stick to the beaches unless there's other peripheral issues going on that require their attention. Uh, Josh. Yeah, thanks for coming back to me, Chris. Um, you know, what, one thing, in, in, this has been going round and around and around, and it doesn't seem like we've gotten a whole lot of uh, results, but, you know, the RV situation. Um, how, do you know how many car, how many, how many tickets you've written or your department has written with the automatic uh, ticket writers? With the electronic ticket writers, how, how many you've you've actually written on the RVs? Uh, I don't have an exact number for you right now. I I've been uh, I some I think they're they're trying to do around. There was about one report I got. It's about twenty six uh, in one week on, on those electronic ticket writers. One of the issues we had is we had to restaff an entire car, and um, that's actually taken some time. And uh, those were circumstances that were outside any of our control. Um, that car has been restaffed and re and uh, the mission's been set. And those are deputies that will be working the overnight. And uh, they've been issued an electronic ticket rider, and they will be enforcing those uh, those oversized vehicle laws overnight. So as far as far as weekly, there has been a lull. We've had uh, some, like I said, some obstacles getting that car restaffed, uh, but we have done so now and. Uh, the uh, car is back on uh, mission uh, to to deal with that issue. When did that car get restaffed? Just this week. Okay. And yeah. do you know how many tickets that, that they've written this week? So far, it's Wednesday. I, I didn't get a number for them, though. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, you know what, I'm, I'm in my office right now. I'm in Cross Street. I'm going to go home, and I'm going to pass by 20 of these, to 20 of these RVs. I, so I had uh, as, uh, on that, I had uh, a count done this evening of the RVs. And this is where we're talking probably have about 530 this evening. And we're looking at uh, 13 RVs within the city limits is what was counted and reported to me. So um, 
And uh, we're, like I said, we're, we're hoping to tamp down on it. Um, I know some people get have been getting the message when they get one of these tickets, they have moved. And they, like one of them particularly seemed to have just recently come back again. So, but I, I do think that, uh, that it's starting to work. Um, they at least see the ticket and the fine amount. So, okay. Yeah. I just, I just want to eloquently and, and gently push as hard, as hard as I can without, without burning bridges with the department and just trying to relay our expectations that these ticket writers will be used these and these RVs will be ticketed. I mean, I, you know, next month, you know, I'm probably going to ask the same questions and, you know, it's, it's important to this community. I mean, I'm also on the homeless task force. We did, we discussed this and um, it's just, you know, frankly, it's just not being done to the level of our expectations here in Malibu. Um, so whatever, whatever we can do, I mean, we've, we've done, you know, signage, additional cars, ticket writers, you know, we've, we've, change ordinances. We, we've done a whole lot for the department. I understand that, that you haven't been there that long. However, we need to get this done, you know, one way, one way or the other. So, you know, I hope, I hope one, you also understand that, um, you know, I've been in uniform before. I understand what it, what it's like. And, um, you know, I also understand what it's like to have people who are out of uniform um, try and, I don't want to say, try and tell you how to do your jobs, but um, I just want to communicate effectively communicate our expectations as a community. And uh, I hope you know that I'm, I'm very pro law enforcement and uh, just want to make that clear. Yeah. Um, you know, I want to actually add something to that. That count is pretty accurate. I had one less RV this afternoon, but Colossus was on the move. So that's probably why they moved again about four o'clock and I didn't catch where they ended up. But when I sent you that dossier that had 11 motor, 11 RVs in it, and that dossier had, those are, some of those have been there two and three years. And uh, what I gave you in there was two or three years worth of info that I have on it from the time I've spit out on the highway and uh, from the VOPs, um, what information they have, et cetera. So these guys that have augered in out there and like have mailboxes next to their motorhomes. You know, there's one down there that hasn't moved. They haven't even pulled a shade open in, in a month, month and a half. It's called the Ultra, and it's on, uh, it's on um, Car or not Carbon. It's on Corral, and that's just one of them. And of course, we know about the big white bus. We know about UFO, etc. But I want to echo what Josh just said because I'm getting hammered by people in the community about it. You know, they're parked across from people's houses. The blue bus is down at La Costa, and you know, for five nights the UFO was parked at Malibu at Surfrider Beach under a no parking sign, no parking 12 to five sign. And it's probably the biggest RV in Malibu. Now he's back at Zuma again now. But some of these guys will tell you that, uh, that the tickets don't apply to them, <laughs> which we all know is not true. They do apply to them. And they think that somehow or another, by the grace of God, they're never going to have to pay their fines. So, it's it you know it's obviously a moving it's a it's a moving target so to speak but in a sense it's not because most of these guys stay put Vector stays put um, there's one that's uh, living right east of Morning View on PCH um, they've stayed put for a long long time so yeah now that you've got the ticket riders and you can go out and and do these I I expect to see really good things and all these guys get their motorhomes and go somewhere else their RVs and go somewhere else Doug. Yeah, uh, Lieutenant, I, I think uh, Josh uh, spoke for all of us. And I know that um, just like Chris, I get hammered with people going, what are you guys going to do about the oversized? And you're not going to find a more supportive group than, than this group to try and whatever you guys need. But I think we need to have uh, what I would call in business, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And I think it'd be really good if at least for the next few months, at, at a bare minimum, you could give us a count on the amount of tickets that are written. I think that would go a long way. Just like we talk about the homeless count, you know, what's the trend line? What's what's the number of um, people that were taken off the street every month? If we could just have that to see what we're doing so we can understand what the effort's re, uh, resulting in. And do we need to put more resources in it or are we, are we getting what we're asking for? 
that's I think that's all we really want from you is get the enforcement and just tell us what's going on. And we're backing you 100%. It's just we got to have some data. Absolutely. Okay. So we cut, did we cover A and B there, Mary or Susan? Did we the cover? Only, the only thing I think we missed and was uh, the VOPs if Mark Russo yeah. is available. Yeah, I knew that. Correct. That part I, I, I know. Are yeah, you there, Mark? He's yeah, he's available. All right. How are you doing, commissioners, everybody, Lieutenant? Great seeing you again. Um, so just kind of a recap. Uh, on the team itself, uh, you know, in the last six months or a little bit longer than that, we, we lost three guys to uh, law enforcement. Um, we've become a pretty good feeder for some of these younger guys that, uh, you know, want to get into a law enforcement career. And we had one of our guys, uh, Connor Blake, he left, he became an LA County Sheriff's deputy. Uh, we had another guy that came a Culver City police officer, and we have another guy that went over to San Bernardino Police Department. So uh, we were sorry to lose, lose them. I mean, they did a, they did a fantastic job for us, but we we actually got three new trainees that were actively training. In fact, we have a training at Malibu City Hall tonight for them. So our current staffing level, we're up to 16 members, which is good. Um for the last year, last fiscal year, VOPs worked a total of uh, 7,730 hours in the city uh, patrolling. Um, we issued uh, 18,343 citations, um, which had a gross fine amount of 1.33 million to the city. Now, if somebody contests it, doesn't pay it, things like that, you know, obviously, but that's just, when we write a ticket, this is how much it costs. And if you look at the amount of sites we wrote, it, it was the equivalent of, uh, you know, $1.33 million, uh, which I think is a pretty good job for a, for a ragtag volunteer outfit. So we, and we appreciate, uh, you know, obviously the city support um, with everything we do. We, we really couldn't do this program, I think, without the, um, support and the funding from the city. So, uh, and then as far as law enforcement activity for us, uh, we issued 354 red tags uh, in the city. And those are basically the sheriff's department 72 hour notice to move. Um, it's a game we play, um, they know it, we know it. Um, in a lot of cases, we do get these vehicles to move, which is great. And that's kind of the intended consequence. Of, of issuing the red tag. It's it's kind of like, you know, hey, we know you're here. And if we come back in 72 hours and you're still here, we're gonna cite you or worse. Um, in terms of uh, law enforcement, and what, we, what we categorize as a law enforcement slash fire department assist, uh, we had a 192 incidents that we were on with law enforcement and or uh, fire department, and that includes traffic collisions. It also includes uh, not only sheriffs, but uh, CHP. A lot of times we get called to assist them up in the canyons if there's a bad accident. We're, we're pretty good with the traffic control aspect there. Uh, so 192 of those um, had about 180, or excuse me, 108 tows that we were involved with, and that's assisting law enforcement with either um, helping them with the tow itself or assisting in writing the CHP 180. So we had about 108 of those in the city. Um, overall, you know, staff is, uh, our staff is really motivated. Uh, we work closely with Lost Hills. Lieutenant Carr has been a great lieutenant uh, with us, works very closely with us, um, you know, open ideas. We strategize a lot on how we can do things best. Uh, we've assisted with a lot of these overnight operations as well. So um, that's kind of your Malibu VOP team in a nutshell. Any questions you guys have, I'd be uh, happy to answer. I have a question, Mark. When will we have the, uh, the new car on the road? Do you have an estimate? You know, I don't. I know that the uh, city has, has signed the revised agreement. I don't know what state it's in, if it's gone back to the county, I suspect it has, but I know that 
based on one of the last city council meetings that the city council approved the um, bailment agreement. And I think it was probably forwarded over to the Lost Hills, which then forwarded to uh, county council. I don't know. Uh, maybe Lieutenant Carr can uh, speak to that or, or uh, Susan, possibly. Um, you know, I, I, I'm sure I speak for everyone in this council, everybody in City Hall and everybody that's anybody that the job you guys do out there is exemplary. I, uh, I'm always amazed at where I see you guys, what I see you guys doing. You're always there, busy days. I pick you guys out and you just get out there and you do your job and you guys do it really well. I don't think I can think of in my time on this earth, I've seen a volunteer organization perform like you guys do. And I hope I'm not a knock on wood there, not jinxing anything, but you guys are amazing. I mean, I, I'm absolutely amazed. Well, I, pre I appreciate that, Chris. You know, we put a lot of effort into training our people. And um, it's kind of funny, it, you know, the, the Sheriff's Department has a volunteer academy and it's, it's, it's a good volunteer academy. It's down in Whittier, um, which geographically is not the best location for us. I, I went to it and we had to be down there twice a week and, and, you know, over a couple of month period and it's, it's a drive. So uh, one thing that was kind of interesting, just a little bit of an anecdotal story, is that we had a guy that he's one of our new trainees. He he transferred from the marina station up to Lost Hills to be part of our team. And uh, they said that, hey, before you go up here, you know, to Lost Hills, you got to go through this VOP Academy, which they do in September. But once they found out that he was destined for Lost Hills in the Malibu VOP team, he said, no, they said, no, you don't have to go to, through our academy. They're going to they're going to train you a heck of a lot better than we're going to train you. So, <laughs> you know, we take our job seriously out here. We do what we can to uh, help the sheriff's department. We had that uh, vehicle versus bicyclist on PCH between Heather Cliff and Westward. You know, we were called by dispatch and um, we were able to mobilize in 15 to 20 minutes and be on scene and be able to, you know, help the deputies with traffic control at Heather Cliff and down at Westward. So, we're, you know, we we have kind of a rapid response component to us as well. And by doing that, you know, we can free up a couple of black and whites, you know, that we're there and we kind of have the outer perimeter, the traffic control. So, you know, we have a great working relationship with uh, the deputies out here and the station. So uh, and it just, you know, keeps better, get, getting better and better for us. Um, everybody's very motivated. And um, I think we're really starting to see the benefits of a uh, of a well-trained, robust team. How long, Mark, one more question. How long have the VOPs been in existence? Somebody asked me that, and I said approximately 10 years. Well, is it at the county level, they've actually been in, you know, they've been, I think, since the 90s. I mean, it was uh, it was a program that was started, you know, and I should know the history of it better, but in terms of Malibu, um, they actually started it, I think, when the city was be, became a city, and then it ran for a couple of years, and I think it shut down uh, for, I don't know what the exact reason. Somebody that's, I think, been in Malibu longer than I have could probably tell you that. But uh, we pretty much started up again, I think, in maybe like possibly 2010 is what we, we did. Yeah. And so, and it's, you know, it's just, we're always evolving. So it's, uh, you know, we try to work really close with fire, with lifeguards, um, you know, and 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 obviously Lost Hills and and a lot of the other agencies. You know, state parks. We do a lot with state parks sometimes. Um, but uh, yeah, it's great. And then we work all the events. You know, so we're always out there. Like we're we're going to be out there this weekend for the uh, half marathon, uh, Saturday and Sunday. So well, we're we're very grateful for what you guys do. And I think on behalf of everyone who and I know, um, thank you. Any questions for Mark? I see some thumbs up. That's not really a question, but I like it. Okay. Well, appreciate everybody's support. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, all right. So I would say we've covered through C now at this point. Would you agree, Mary and Susan? Yes. In the, in the minutes, I'm going to say that five A, B, and C were heard concurrently. Okay, great. So 
We're on to 5D, and that's Rob DeBow. That is me. <laughs> it is you. That is me. So uh, tonight, uh, we are giving a presentation on a MRCA um, proposal to do some projects within the city. Um, MRCA did send out a, a EIR that documented or that, uh, that has shown two projects within the city that they're proposing to do. Uh, they are, it's two, they are actually doing some camping grounds within uh, the city. First one is uh, Malibu Bluffs Park open space. Um, that's gonna be include uh, flameless uh, facilities days, facilities, parking, restrooms, landscaping, picnic areas, trail improvements, uh, support facilities, which is, includes a ranger, residence, medical building, office, kitchen, uh, fuel modifications, vegetation management to reduce fire hazards, um, pedestrian and vehicle bridges to provide access over drainage and streams, uh, water source tanks, and fire protection systems. Um, the other one includes the Ramirez Canyon Park. Um, this also includes famous uh, flameless facilities, which are tent pad sites, uh, some day use facilities, which includes parking, restrooms, landscaping, picnic areas, paths, and interpretive uh, signage. Project also include fuel modification, a vegetation management, and um, items to reduce wildfire hazards. Um, this project is, uh, is up for actually comment right now. Uh, the city is actually looking actually to provide comments back to MRCA. This item is brought to you so we can gather the commission's comments. We can include those comments into the city's comments back over to the MRCA. Um, city council will be, will be having a presentation on this from staff at the November 28th meeting. And then shortly after that, we will include recommendations uh, for comments back over uh, to the MRCA. Um, the, uh, um, yeah, so with that, um, we have further questions and I think we probably have several uh, comments and things we wanna discuss and note so we can uh, add that to our list. So floor is yours. Chris, you're muted. Basically, I just called for questions. I have uh, comments if you want to do comments. I think that's what Rob's looking for. I think so. Okay. Um, you know, personal opinion and ed editorial comment. I think doing this, uh, these two projects is reflective of somebody who's got too much money on their hands. Um, both these sites are, I, if this was a business, you could never get anybody to invest in it because take the one at Bluffs, and now I'm being editorial, take the Bluffs Park one, you're right next to a highway. You have a, a one small trail down to a small beach and your platform that you're going to be on this, this land site is basically a postage stamp and you're going to put 450 people on it because yes, yeah, it talks a lot about a lot of acreage but a lot of that's ESHA, you can't go into it. So the part that you can actually use is a minimal. So let me give you my, my quick comments on, on Bluff Park. Um, and by the way, I'm not being a NIMBY on this, but there's a better use for this land as open space than to pack it full of uh, uh, you know, 160 acre, 250 acre summer camp on probably four or five acres. Um, the septic system, for 450 people is gotta be huge. And right next to an ESHA area, I can't see how they're gonna get away with that. Um, you've got 30 or 40 parking spaces for 450 people. We keep talking about fire issues around the town for events and so forth. Here you've got 450 people that only have parking spaces for 10 or 40, 40 cars. That means you got 10, people to a car. You can't evacuate all these people out of there. So suddenly our fire resources people are now having, our sheriff's department 
in the event of a fire, have to divert from putting out the fire or protecting the Malibu residents to get these people out of a campsite. Uh, a ridiculous uh, uh, plan relative to the number of evacuated uh, people to be taken out. Um, ranger oversight. They're going to have one ranger there for 450 people or however many people. There needs to be a better staffing plan and a real commitment by MRCA, which they've never made before, to actually put the rangers in place and how they're going to run it. I, I go back to my days in Boy Scout camps. There were a lot more rangers or a lot more scoutmasters there than one little ranger house. So this just this just reeks of, of minimal oversight, if any. Uh, the trails on the map don't seem to match the existing trails that are there. I can't, I can't speak for that. I don't know what the final is going to be in the EIR, but it just seems the little bit of hiking I've done in that area, this just didn't seem to match when I looked at the map. Now to talk about uh, Ramirez Canyon, which is outside the city, uh, once again, why would you put a campsite there? There's nothing there there. You're not on the backbone trail necessarily. You're away from any anything to go see except to spend the night in your tent site, and you got nowhere to go because you're sitting right in the middle of a residential area. Uh, dumber and rocks, I guess. Um, the other thing I, I want to ask you, Rob, or maybe this is more of a, a Richard Malika question, how do you get a permit in the city of Malibu to do this? Or are they saying this is a public works project? I mean, I, don't we have any oversight on this? Yeah, I would think that there would have to be some type of uh, uh, CDP to get this. Uh, um, some of the things that you also mentioned too, they're septic. They are that property. Part of that property is in the septic prohibition. No, actually, all of it is in the septic prohibition. Yeah. Um, part of it is in zone is in phase three. The other one is not even identified, and so um, they have a little bit of kind of issues with with that one for the one over by bluffs. I can tell you from my days, you know, many moons ago as a Boy Scout, 450 boys uh, in a campground, because I actually went to a camp about that size, I remember. That's a huge camp. And we're going to park it on a postage stamp. Like I said, I don't see how in the world this this ever meets anybody's desires for camping. I just, like I said, I think it's dumber than rocks. Um, anyway, that's my two cents. And I think they'd be a lot better off in both these places to remain it the way it is and make it an open space, and especially one of the mirrors, which is right next to a residential area. That, that makes no sense. Who wants to camp out next to somebody's backyard? All right, that's fine. Josh, thank you, Doug. You know, yeah, I'm gonna kind of leave the, the planning stuff aside with the septic and I'll, I'll let the planning commission figure that out. Maybe the public works commission figure that out, but um, before I kind of get into the safety issues, you know, I was on the Parks and Rec Commission when we did the swap with back, right? And I can tell you that the MRCA left Charmley Park in absolute shambles. We had to close the park and repair all the trails, and it took years and at considerable city expense. I mean, the, the MRCA... <laughs> They, they don't they don't really care but um i love that they're seeking input from reviewing agencies i think that i'm sure they're going to take our comments to heart and yeah yeah i doubt it but um you know i've i've spent a whole lot of time in campgrounds it's one of my favorite things to do i do it with my family all the time and there's there's one thing that kids like to do when they go camping it's eat s'mores and it doesn't matter if there's fire rings or not. People are going to light fires. That's just that's just a fact of the matter, especially when you can go down and pick up a bundle of firewood at Ralph's or they're going to be snapping off, you know, twigs of chaparral and all that good stuff. I'm just I'm mortified that they're trying to build campgrounds here. I think it's just it's a disaster. We don't have the resources to manage them. They don't have the wherewithal, the resources or the care to manage what they're trying to do. Um, it's just, it's just disgusting. I think it's a disgusting use of the bluffs. I think it's a disgusting use of Ramirez. 
Um, the public safety concerns are obvious. Um, can, we, can, fire comes with camping and it, it just doesn't matter if they're calling it flameless or not. One, one ranger that, that will never show up is there to manage a bunch of kids. Give me a break. You know, I, I'm going to have some stronger words later, probably as this thing may or may not come to fruition, but um, I hope our planning department and our public works department, you know, makes them jump through every possible hoop. Um, I don't have specific comments on w what this is going to look like because I don't think that their, their plan um, is specific enough. I think it, they just haphazardly threw it together and it's going to try and change, but. So can, can I just, it, it sounds like Josh and like you're, you're concerned about the fire issues and camping associated with that. So uh, um, that's great. That's, that's great input. Um, if it's what will help us and will actually help Mary when she's writing everything down is kind of let Mary know the specific kind of things that you, comments that you guys feel this plan or this, this project poses. I, I think very good stuff that, that Doug put or, together. Sure. So, yeah. I just, I was yeah. just sitting there complaining for a few minutes, but um, yeah, no, yeah, no problem. Yeah, complaining. Yeah, no, no, but, no. Okay. So I guess, I guess my concerns are, I, look, there's going to be a fire every night. That's just the fact of the matter. There's going to be fires every single day and there's going to be no one there to say, don't do that. And there's going to be no one there to make sure that it gets out of control. Um, you know, it's, you know, I don't know what these water storage tanks are going to look like. I mean, I know that there's an old one there. Um, they're probably not going to reuse that or um, restore it in any way, but um, we've already had an incident where, um, there were some unhoused people tapping into the water main up there and it was leaking, you know, and it's, and if that happens again, the, is there a risk of flooding for the residents downstream on Malibu road, Ramirez? I mean, that's a big water main. I don't know what's going to happen up there. Um, if they're proposing support facilities with a ranger residence, there needs to be an absolute minimum of rangers per X number of campers. And I, I don't know what that number is, but there's gotta be, you know, some precedent to say, Hey, look, you've got to have one ranger per 20 or per 60 or whatever that number is. Um, because one, I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. They're, they're proposing a ranger residence, a medical building, an office, a kitchen. Are they serving food? Are they selling food? I, I mean, that's, we've had, kitchen fires in the past um and isn't it zoned open space i mean they're telling us we can't use we can't do a snack shack and they're telling us they want to build an office and a kitchen and a medical building and ranger residence and all these things so uh good luck getting through planning that's i think kind of my thing but um i have a lot of thoughts on this outside of the public safety scope so I'm going to let the other commissions handle that, but for now I'm done. Uh, Brent, before I move over to you, I want to remind um, the commissioners here that we're going to need to make a motion that summarizes our concerns that we can be submitted to the council. So we'll listen to Brent and Keegan. If you'd like to speak, I'm pretty much on board with really what's already been said. So I'm not going to um, duplicate, but uh, Brent, go ahead. Yeah, th th thank you, Chris. And um, I just want to say I agree completely with what uh, Doug Stewart and what Joshua was saying about the concerns. I I think on the fire side, this is just a disaster waiting to happen because I agree completely. Uh, yeah, I was a Boy Scout. I was an Eagle Scout, too, and had a troop and did all those fun things. But, um, hey, there's going to be fires there, and that's just too high a risk. But I also see these Facilities is an attractive nuisance for uh, late night homeless folks to move in as well. I mean, I, I don't know how they're going to have the rangers being able to manage it 24 hours a day, but great. You're creating a great location for somebody to just, you know, set up their own tent, move in and not move out. Um, and, and I just think they're trying to cram too much into too, too few acres in such a small space, trying to do everything that, um, is is a bit of overkill. So 
I just agree with the previous comments, but I also think you create your own problem from a homeless standpoint as well. Back to you, Chris. Thank you, Brent. Keegan, did you want to speak? Uh, yeah, I have probably a slightly unpopular opinion here. Um, if the, if the, I, it's my belief that if the property is managed properly, which I personally don't think it will be, it won't be, <laughs> um, meaning that it's staffed, right? Um, just as staffed as let's use a, let's use Leo Creo as a benchmark, right? Leo Creo has open flame still, correct? Yeah. Right? How many fires have we seen there? Not many, right? <laughs> and the majority of our disaster fires, or almost all of our disaster fires come at red flags, right? I know that Leo Creo doesn't allow fires during red flags. Um, so I think the end, the other thing too, is that it's at the beach. Um, if there was a red flag, then it would blow towards the ocean. Yes, there's a handful of homes there, which would, it could potentially be a disaster. Um, but I don't think it's as much of an issue having open flames as long as there's personnel there. But I have a really low expectation for them just based on their track record, um, you know, policing the thing, taking care of it, and also their land management and stewardship towards environmentalism, et cetera, is also very shoddy at best in the past. So um, anyways, that's, uh, those are my thoughts. Um, my thoughts. Um, I concur with Keegan that managing it, I, I have no hope that they're going to manage it properly. I haven't seen it done yet. And I've been dealing with MRCA for over 20 years now and it's never ended well. So um, as far as Bluffs Park, yeah, there's a handful of houses below it that all burned in a fire that started in Bluffs Park about 15 years ago. We lost eight houses down there from fire. But also the one in Ramirez, Keegan, I live at the mouth of that canyon. We lost, I don't know, a hundred something homes in here in a fire in 82. So. Ramirez Canyon sits next to Latigo. It's really part of that whole Latigo system, which has the most fires anywhere in Malibu in history. No, no, I, I was I was only speaking about Bluffs. Okay, I, I'm on Fair board enough. with I'm on board with Ramirez. Yeah, I'm just trying to put some context for Bluffs. Fair enough. I I just I you know I just can't see them managing. If they had a perfect management record or a 98 percent management record, I could probably look at this with different eyes, but knowing what they've done in the past and knowing what I've seen, trying to get a hold of them, trying to get them to do anything. It's, it's, it's non-existent. So, you know, from that standpoint, I really don't want them managing anything in the city of Malibu or right next to it until they learn how to do that properly. That's my take on it. Um, if we don't have any more questions though, we need to summarize this into a, uh, a, uh, a recommendation to make to the council. Maybe I could. Uh, I've kind and of. And also, let me let me point something else out too. The Ramirez, the Ramirez Mesa area, um, and the area of Ramirez Mesa, Ramirez Canyon, and and Paradise Cove is, I think it's more safe than Leo Carrillo from the standpoint of a fire. But that's that's just my opinion. I agree with you, Keegan. They do a lot of fires up there, but they have good staffing up there, and uh, they staff that place. They got a lot of state guards up there. Many of them are friends of yours. And uh, they do a dang good job. So anyway, no, that's that, that's what I that's what I meant is I wanted yeah. to reference Leo Creo as as a, a good standard, right? They've done a really good job with staffing, policing, yes, oversight, red flag, blah blah. blah. And clearly, that's a successful campground. Agreed, absolutely so, agreed. So let me Doug, kind of just jump in on that one too. Isn't that state parks running that rather than MRC? Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's our point. I'm just saying as a reference, yeah, point of reference. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just address the the what kind of Keegan was saying about the fire incidents at, at Leo? You know, it's it's counterintuitive when you when you have fires in an area that, that you're allowed to have fires, those fire rings that they have do a great job of managing, you know, where those flames go. 
and campers know you keep them you just keep it in the ring but if they have flameless sites these campers are just going to have their little you know twig fires and those twig fires man they blow everywhere they're not they're not safe at all and I, i've seen that before at, at some of these other campgrounds and primitive campsites that i've been to and it's sketchy it's real sketchy um i don't know how to i don't know really where i'm going with this but i, I think that that's um you know i, I just i just wanted to kind of address it's not like i'm disagreeing with you but uh i think that the, the the reason we haven't seen big incidents is because of those fire rings and how effective they are and I'm just certainly not advocating for them to say, oh, great, let's let's start, you know, putting fire rings up there because that's just stu- that's just stupid. But um, I don't even know where to begin to craft a motion here. Um, I've got notes. Um, excuse me. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mary. I have some I've got notes of things that the different commissioners have mentioned um, that we could possibly put into a, a motion. Um, the motion would basically say that so-and-so moved and -and so-and-so seconded a motion to provide a recommendation to the city council that it consider including the following concerns in its comment, in the city's comment letter to MRCA in response to its, whatever this public works plan is. And the things that I got were that fire, and you can reword these if you want to, but fires every day with no one there to ensure it did not happen and did not get out of control. That the existing water storage tanks, I couldn't tell if you said that the existing tanks leaked or were in disrepair. Something about the existing water storage tanks and that the water main was insufficient for the number of uh, campers anticipated. Well, well, I, yeah, what I was saying was that there's a, there's an old abandoned tank, and I think that uh, was it. Larry Thorne, it was, somebody used to dry farm corn up there, like way back in the day, and uh, there's so there's an old concrete tank, and you can see it on on Google Google Maps if you if you go kind of look at it. But that's abandoned. It's just I I don't know where I was going with that. I was just rambling. So you um, want me to take that out about? Yeah, I just take it out. Okay. Um, but you said something about the water main being insufficient. Yeah, some some homeless people tapped into uh, there's there's a water line down there. It kind of runs from John Tyler down to um, the bottom of Malibu Road, where there's like a trailhead at the bottom of Malibu Road, where I want to say it's like two four five two four five seven zero maybe might be the the address block down there um but it runs down there anyway and they they tapped into it and it was leaking for god knows who how long and and i was just trying to basically say that that the mrca doesn't really manage their properties doesn't look at their properties okay Uh, i was getting that but you know a couple things that that i do want to make sure that we recommend to the city council is they have to come with a strong evacuation plan with for both properties um and don't we all we have the no camping ordinance during um you know when the live fuel moisture gets to a certain um certain number no camping in esha so can't we make these recommendations that hey once the once the live fuel moisture gets to x percent there's no camping at all sure we can we can make you know, we can put whatever we want in that motion, whatever we agree on. To, to and then my, I, I do have a question. So if we, if, if a crime occurs with it, that city limits, I mean, you're, you're not supposed to have a fire. And if you do have a fire, the, obviously that's, that's some sort of crime. Can we, re- can we as a commission recommend to the city council that we bump up those illegal fire uh citation amounts and then would the mrca be be paying for that or would the campers be paying for that i believe it well be- they, it, this is not technically uh, correct me if i'm wrong rob this would not be considered within the city limits because it's not city because it's not it's owned by someone else it's kind so, something like the the pier is owned by the state so can I, I'm not sure. 
I don't know how that works. No, yeah. It's in the, no, it's in the city limits, but it's it's yeah. MRCA property, but it is inside the city limits. Yeah. Well, I, it's within I, it's it's between boundary one and boundary two, but so is a lot of county property. And so the 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 city doesn't consider it within the city limits because the property is not the property itself is not. It, it's state property. It, not it's yeah. They still have to get a permit through a uh, coastal development p permit. There it is. The, the pier okay. is a little bit different because it goes out past the mean high tide line, and that then becomes a state and kind of a weird kind of kind of you know just a weird situation with that. But I mean, anything else within the city limits has to, even if it's a state, Caltrans has to still get TDPs through us for their projects. And same, same with the MRCA will have to, the same thing. So Josh, you were saying you wanted to include in your recommendation to the council that it consider increasing the citation fines for violation of the city's what ordinance? Which ordinance were you referring to? I, th I don't know the, the name of the specific ordinance, but it's it, it it's campfires, right? Bonfires, campfires. I don't know. Okay. Maybe someone smarter than me can can figure that we out. We can look it up. Yeah. Yeah, basically... it. And then also, could we recommend that the city council, the city manager, have have a quick? I don't want to say. Um, if it is in the city. Do we have jurisdiction to label them as a nuisance property? If if we keep if they keep on having fires, if this is a recurring thing, can we then say, hey, you are now a nuisance property and we can we can begin levying fines? Um that's probably a question for the city attorney. I think one thing you got to realize too is if there's going to be conditions on their CDP, um, whatever those conditions we come up with and kind of happen. If an applicant or a landowner violates those CDPs, then we can we could we can revoke the CDP and then they'll be in violation of that and further sanctions could be could be um, you know levied on them because of that. But um, creating a nu nuisance would be something that probably the city attorney would have to look into. Well, we just we, changed. We just changed our. We we adjusted the ordinance, right? And it essentially what we wanted to do is make it easier for the city to say to property owners, "Hey, you are not taking effective steps to mitigate obvious risks. You're not taking even reasonable steps." And to me, I mean, this is we we see the writing on the wall here. There will be fires. And if they keep having fires, then we should be able to label them a nuisance property and levy fines. Okay, so what I yeah. what I put here, Josh, is I'm just trying to, to spitball with the rest of the commission. Yeah, right. yeah no, that's no, it's good. To it's ask good. if the city can label the property a nuisance in response to multiple violations of the city's CDP in accordance with the city's nuisance ordinance. Is that what we're saying? Or multiple violations of city ordinances? Yeah. What should we say? Like three. And then, well, he, and then also demand yeah. that that the that the MRCA allow city staff and city and maybe the in our contracted services such as Lost Hills and or fire and or lifeguard wh whoever it is to be able to access the property and inspect the property at any time. Mm. Right. I don't want I don't want the rangers to sit there at the at the entrance and be like, sorry guys, you can't come in here and make sure that we're doing the right thing. We need to have our own oversight. Okay. Gosh, those are all really good recommendations. I like those. Yeah, those are good. Don't interrupt me. I'm on a roll. No, I got go. <laughs> you're, you're assuming hey Josh, you're assuming to be a ranger there to beat them too. So Right, well, that's what they're saying, right? And that's when, and what Rob is saying that there's conditions on their coastal development permit. So if there's conditions that there's, hey, there has to be a ranger on on site. I'm saying, hey, there should be four rangers on site or ten rangers, whatever, whatever we decide tonight to make a recommendation to the city council, and they can they can figure out what's reasonable and what's not. But um, maybe we just leave it open ended for the for the city council and say an appropriate number of yeah. rangers. 
Yeah, uh, that's the word I was thinking. Yeah, and let them think about it because this kind of came up, I mean, pretty quickly, right? I mean, we didn't have a whole lot of time to, you know, accurately address. And then when they come with the CDP, then they're going to come with, you know, much, they go before planning for the coastal development permit, it's going to be much more in depth and maybe we can revisit it then. But, um, you know, I mean, I think that some of this other stuff, medical building, office, kitchen, I mean, those are all workers. I mean, that's, I mean, how many parking spaces are they, are they going to have need just for them? I mean, they can't, they can't park on PCH. I don't know where they're coming from, but that's, again, that's a planning question. Well, I, I think it's probably a valid comment that this type of use is going to generate an excessive amount of traffic and parking issues for these two sites. Which, if I could uh, throw in two cents here, I, yeah. I've got mine divided into uh, safety issues and I've got uh, called environmental issues. Josh is on a perfect roll there. I, lo I love what he's saying. On the evacuation plan, this is, to me is the biggest risk in this whole project is not just the fact you're going to burn down the houses, but now we're going to have 450 people at risk or however how many are going to be at the other site. They need to have an uh, evacuation plan. And, you know, just like a building, if you have a, uh, an office building, you have to test your fire system and your evacuation plans periodically. There needs to be an evacuation plan that satisfies the city requirements and they test it to our satisfaction. And trying to get 450 people out on short notice when there's a fire, it just, I just boggles the mind. And, you know, this is just like the Pepperdine questions that we've had in the past where people say, oh, we're gonna shelter in place. Well, how are you gonna shelter 450 people in place? You gotta have a place to take them and you gotta have a way to get them there. So I think this evacuation issue and the fire issue, fires that they cause, fires that affect them, evacuation. And then you get into the uh, environmental side of things, the ESHA area, I just find that to be incredible. They're gonna have 450 people and nobody's going to traipse through the Esha and not going to destroy it. I mean, this is a recipe for losing that entire Esha area. If we have any responsibility at all as a city is to protect our environmentally sensitive areas. And we're going to plop 450 people right next to one and they have to walk through it to get down to the beach, be gone. Be a mess. You so, know, Doug, I'd like to add to that too, the number of resources that they tie up in our city, fire, sheriff, lifeguards, you name it. They're gonna, they're gonna tie up a, I mean, you know, you have hundreds of people camping, you might as well have hundreds of new houses because they're gonna generate medical calls, they're gonna generate all kinds of different calls. So there's a resource management issue there. And I'm sure that MRCA isn't gonna stock those campgrounds with all those resources. Well, you're right, Chris, and you're talking about, um, and Mary, I don't know how we write this into it. This is like a 5% population increase from Malibu overnight population. We've got 10,000 residents here on census. Now we're gonna have, call it 500 more by the time you put everybody there. This is, this is a huge drain on our resources. By the way, point, point noted from earlier, the fire code for unopened fire is 904, our code, code number on it. Josh, you have your hand up. Still. Yeah, you know, something, something came to mind. Um, I had a client install um, a fire protection system on his house. That's like super advanced and super cool. And what it has is um, automatic sprinklers tied to infrared sensors. So if it senses fires, it just, it, it can send out an alert. So I don't know if we should ask them to be required to install infrared sensors with maybe an alert siren for the campground and or automatic sprinklers is we have a very, I mean, if there's a fire and there's any sort of wind, it's, it's going up. We're not going to have any sort of response time to get the, to get the air units up, to get our people down on uh, Malibu road up. Um, we're going to need a lot of, a lot of water on that thing real quick. So I think um, we need to shorten the lead time between a report of fire automatically hitting um, 
the fire department. So, I mean, it, there's new technology out there that can, that can help with that. And Josh, also to point out, Ramirez is in a fire tunnel. It's in a chimney. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. And then, um, you know, they, they have this plan on the bluffs, just, just a camp above, right? But you know people are going to be going down below. So are those, are those rangers roving patrols between the hours of, let's get like 6 a.m. and 10 p.m.? I mean, when, when campers are up? I don't think anybody knows at this point. Yeah. <laughs> well, these are all conditions that should be in the coastal development permit. You know, having roving oh. patrols, having infrared sensors, having an evacuation plan, um, no camping during uh, live fuel moisture levels that we deem reasonable, um, wind levels that we deem reasonable. Um, you know, Josh, what we're trying to do is summarize our concerns so that, you know, I don't think we're being asked to give them an exact um, solution to each item, but to summarize the concerns that it's, it's a drain on our resources, uh, it's a fire hazard, it's, uh, I mean, I think Doug and you adequately pointed out all the items that, um, that are in play here. So, I so, think how, so when, this, when this happens, so the, it's going to be, voted on by the planning commission eventually right for their coastal development permit and they have the opportunity to impose certain conditions within that coastal development permit so as yeah. members of the public we could go and say hey we're you know mr mazza mr jennings mr hill whoever hey could could you kindly add some of these and then they'd make a friendly amendment and mrca could say yes they could say no and then it could be voted yes, voted no, or can go to uh, the next level. Or it doesn't even have to be a friendly amendment. It can just be part of their permit. Or, yeah. or you know, just hearing your guys' concern from staff, we can make sure those issues and those things are included into the CDP and the conditions of the CDP. So that yeah you may not have to go up and do that if those items are already done so it's just a matter of just communicating that back to staff some of the things and we, and, and we can make sure we have something in there to, to address those concerns the other thing is is that your recommendations and the public works commission is going to have a similar discussion and make their own recommendations these are going to go to the council along with staff's um, draft comments on the plan. So this is, it, it, it's in the very, I believe in fairly early stages. Yep. So this public comment period, and there's nothing that stops any of you from submitting yep. your own personal public comment, just be sure not to identify yourself as a commissioner that you're speaking as a resident of Malibu. Um, but these comments then go back to the MRCA. They could possibly modify the plan to incorporate some of the recommendations they get from the city and other agencies. And then they, you know, present it again and hear it again. And then there may be, you know, maybe they won't go far enough. Maybe they'll exceed what you asked for. Maybe they won't address some of them. And then the city continues to, to work. And then you worry about possibly, you know, incorporating things into the CDP. But it's possible that it, it's possible that they could actually hear these concerns and say, oh, yeah, we can incorporate that into the plan. I, just a, a, a matter of logistics, where is the water line? Is it on the other side of Pacific Coast Highway? I know that um, the case had to pull it across the highway to get to those homes. Rob, do you know where that where that water main is? I want to say, from my recollection, when we did phase one. On the west side, south side. I, I think there's two of them. There's one during the center, and then I think there's another one on the west side, as Chris mentioned, too. So I think there's two of them. Okay. There's so also one on Malibu Road. Road. Recommendation. I, was, I was just curious. Um, the one on Malibu Road also. Yeah, they're not going to bring it up. They they'll they'll bring it from the highway. 
is they're going to have to get, they're going to have to have the robust flow. They're going to have to meet the fire department requirements for the ranger station, the medical place, the office, the kitchen, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to, they're not going to bring it up. They're going to bring it down. I'm just saying that's a second source, Josh. Yeah. You know, who knows? Who knows what, how they would tie that in? You know, everything's on the table at the beginning. Chris, don't we need to come up with a resolution that points out our yes. concerns from fire uh, for safety issues? I think these are all good environmental issues and, and things to be considered. But uh, at this stage, it's really about trying to put our concerns in for the environmental impact report, which I think are safety issues. I think that, Mary, what have you crafted anything other than the opening part of that? Out of yeah. We... Hang on. Okay, um, so the opening thing is that you're providing a recommendation to the city council that the following concerns be included in the city's comments presented to MRCA in response to its Malibu lower cost accommodations public works plan. Hang on. Okay, what I have so far is that fires every day with no one there to ensure it did not happen and did not get out of control. And I may wordsmith this a little bit just to make it sound a little better, that the existing water main in the bluffs area was either leaking or insufficient for the number of campers. I think, I don't, I don't think that's uh, worthy of going in. I think that's a concern, but I don't think that's a safety issue because they'll fix that. Yeah, I agree. So take that out. Yeah. Okay. I don't think it's the one that's, I think it's the one on Malibu Road that was leaking anyway. Okay. Um, the ranger residence needs to include a minimum number of rangers per the number of campers. That question whether the kitchen will be used to prepare food for sale. That facilities could become an attractive nuisance to late night homeless individuals. Oops that it must include a strong evacuation plan for both properties. And I think below, wait, we had something else that meets city requirements and should include regular testing of the plan. Hang on, yes. that came later and I can combine those two. Um, something about the drain on city resources. Oh, well, I haven't, haven't gotten to there yet, hold on. Okay, um, fair enough. That the city's ordinance, oh, that the city's ordinance prohibiting camping in Esha when live fuel moisture reaches a minimum level should close the campground. Consider increasing citation fines for violations of the city's campfire ordinance. And we'll look up what that ordinance number is or the municipal code number is and include that. Um, question. 904, Mary. That's an ordinance number. I need the municipal code. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> can the city label the property a nuisance in response to multiple violations of city ordinances in accordance with the city's nuisance ordinance? Allow city inspections of the property at any time for compliance with the city's ordinances and CDP. Determine an appropriate number of rangers per campers as part of the CDP. That's something we set up above, so I'll combine those two into one. Is there, are, is there, ugh, are there sufficient parking spaces for the number of MRCA rangers and staff? How is MRCA going to ensure campers will not walk through ESHA? Campgrounds will be a significant strain on city public safety resources. What I didn't know is you want, did you want to suggest that the council consider charging, them, requesting an accounting and charging them for it? Um, um, there's that, and, I mean, what do you, what do you, rest of the commissioners there, how do you feel about that? Can you please repeat? That I, well, it mentioned that the campgrounds will be a significant strain on city public safety resources. Do you want to add to that to suggest that the council um, require a, an a, annual, semi-annual, a regular accounting of those resources used 
and bill MRCA for them? The fire department is county. Fire department wouldn't count. It would just be a uh, sheriff. And then you know, if beach team, that would be the only ones that the city pays for by contract are the beach team and sh or sheriff resources. So which includes the beach team. Fire and, and life, fire and lifeguards are not billed to the city. You know, just to throw this in there, and I'm not trying to make this go on forever, but when somebody bills a 400 unit planned unit development, they're required to up the game for resources, whether they build a right. fire station or whether they add a ambulance bay or whatever they do, um, almost like a mellow roost type thing, Rob, but they're, they're required to do certain things. And like Doug said, there's the percentage raised for that would be like 4%, raising the population of Malibu 4% overnight. So maybe there should be a requirement in there that the public resource, uh, the public resources be upped in accordance with that at their expense. I don't know really how to, how to say that or word that. I know what I mean. Um, that's why we have mayor. I, I think at this point, I, I would recommend just making it general right now. Don't get specific okay. on. Okay. okay. Just say the campgrounds yeah. will be a sig And then the last thing, um, somebody said something about require an alert siren and or automatic sprinkler system in each campground. I would say and, not and or. Okay. Just, uh, you know, I, I don't know if, if we say something like in, include all available, all reasonably available technologies in order to um, identify, rapidly identify um, fires on the property. Yeah. Something like that. That's it. Yeah, then we that's, could say such as such as infrared sensors, or... clear yeah. alert sirens, automatic sprinklers. I mean, I don't want to like spray a bunch of foam on some campers, <laughs> but I mean, sure would be a good story. So you want to say. Do you want that to be a requirement? Suggestion at the very, very least. I mean, we're talking about a very high risk, high risk population. I mean, we're talking about a whole bunch of kids, right? That's, that's the focus of this thing. And we know what kids do. They just love to follow the rules. Mm -hmm. uh, Josh, I, I support this idea. And I, and I think that there's a little bit of precedent for it with, some of the newer technology that's around, including some of the stuff that the adjacent to the fire department uses with some of the fire detecting cameras, as well as the infrared stuff that like Bobby and a few other people are using with that detect flames. Um, so I think regardless of what sort of oversight is there, even if there is great oversight, like at, um, like at Leo Carrillo, I think having an ability to have some sort of automatic flame detection uh, is is uh, is also like an economic um, possibility because of these. They're not super expensive, so um, I, I I support that suggestion for sure. And then maybe one step further that those that those alerts are shared with the city of Malibu as well as relevant agencies, right? So if it's wh whoever it is, if it's Lost Hills, if it's the fire department, that way we also know what's going on. That way the NR MRCA can't sit there and say, oh yeah, 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 we've never had an alert. So we've, we've, we have the ability to monitor it as well. Okay, so include that, all- That might lead back to kind of the, the idea where I was going with the nuisance property. So include all reasonably available technologies in order to rapidly identify fires on the property, such as an alert siren or automatic sprinkler system to be shared with the city and local public safety agencies. Yes. Hi. Yeah, it sounds pretty good. Sounds good. Everybody in agreement? Did we miss anything? Oh. We probably did, but you, you, 
Do you want to read that whole thing back? It's pretty long, isn't it? Um, let me hang on a second. I'm going to see if I can post it where the screen could be shared. Hold on. I don't know how easy it's going to be to read, but can you display that, Parker? Oh, look at that. Well done. Wow. It's not all there at the same time, but so there you go. So there's the beginning. I have I have a question here. If if we're making a making a recommend not a recommendation, if we're addressing our concerns, would mm -hmm. we be asking questions in here or would we be making comments? Because we've got a mixture of both. It's there are a mixture of both, but it, you were saying that the the following concerns be included in the city's comment letter. So some of those may be suggestions. Okay. We could say comments and or concerns and suggestions. Yeah. I, okay, I see that. I would suggest one thing in the comment about the camping in Esha and the life of moisture. Do we even need to say Esha? Maybe just city's ordinance prohibiting camping when life field moistures are low, whether it's Esha or not. Right. Doesn't yeah, matter. I so I would remove Ashen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is there a different, just for my own education, is there a different threshold on the live fuel moisture or is it is it the same, you know, no camping? I mean, I know that we have a no camping ordinance, but um, when we enter a state of emergency as we just did, does it does the ESHA trigger something different? No. Okay. Thank you. No. You know, one thing I might recommend, the, the part about the food uh, for sale at the kitchen. Yeah. That's hard, to, that's hard to put it in some kind of a safety issue. Yeah. Um, probably have to take that out. Take that out? Yeah, I think so. So there wasn't concern about the, if it was for sale, it might be larger quantities that would be more of a safety issue? No? I think my, my, my issue talking about the kitchen was just the overall usage of, of, of the kitchen. And I mean, how, how do you cook? You use, you use flame. I mean, whether it's an oven or a range or, or whatever to barbecue, whatever it is. Uh, I think that was just my, my concern, whether it's for sale or not is kind of irrelevant. Well, do you want you know to, what? I think, I think we can take it out. I'm just, I'm just saying that I was just spitballing. I think you were thinking about the snack shack on the same property over the little league field, kind of drawing that out a little bit. Well, that, and you know what, in our, in our, I don't blame you in our report, you know, there were in noteworthy incidences, but they would talked about the Soho house and how that burned. Um, and that's just, that's, that was from a lack of maintenance on the range hood. And, you know, we're all talking about how the MRCA doesn't do of, bang up job of maintaining their facilities so what do we think is going to happen i but you know i can take it out it actually, i think it's not necessarily I with you I on think. that at the start but now i'm listening to what he just said and thinking why not just leave it in there because he's he's correcting his his uh his description of what happened at soho and it was lack of maintenance and mrca is known for that well, I don't think the food for sale makes any difference. It's really a question of uh, would the kitchen uh, cooking facilities be properly maintained? Okay, I can change that to will the kitchen and food preparation areas be properly maintained? And then 
and then also, you know, a lot of people use camp stoves to cook. Can we can we ask to prohibit camp stoves in it in their in its yep. entirety? It's supposed to be flameless. So I think well, I mean, yeah, everybody has the jet boil stuff and they have the um you know the little camping stoves and they're gonna be boiling water for for coffee and to make their mm -hmm. eggs in the morning. I mean I've I don't think I've ever not had one at a campsite. Jet boil's not flameless, so that's alcohol, but or it's broke, they're usually broken. They're still, I've got one sitting right in front of me here. They're, but they still have a flame. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But we can just put in there to make sure to prohibit the use of camp stoves. They're cooking all together. Do you want to prohibit cooking of any kind in a campground i don't know i i just what do you guys think i i don't i don't know i think well, i mean all, all the cooking to a uh a secure kitchen is what we're really after yeah exactly yeah secure you know, well maintained if this thing kitchen. is if this thing is approved you know i if this thing is approved and we're able to make it safe, I, you know, I don't really see a whole bunch of a safety issue with, you know, somebody making coffee in the morning. It's, you know, and, and ultimately if it is approved, you know, I, I don't want to ruin some kids camping experience. I just want it to be managed properly. If this thing is approved. You know, Josh, if they have electricity in the campsite, you know, they can plug in. I mean, I see people take coffee makers and microwaves. They plug them in the back of their truck in many cases. So I, I, you know, they can they can still prepare food without having open flame. So I think this is really a discussion about open flame. Okay. Am oh, I correct? Is, those, those would certainly trigger the the infrared. The microwave would? No, the the camp stove. Oh, I well, no, I don't think there should be any open flame. I, I think right. I agree with with that part of it. You can request that they specifically prohibit the use of camp stoves because you understand that that's an open flame, but somebody else might not. So, but if it's written in there, camp stoves are prohibited, that makes it a little easier to enforce. How about open flame, including but not limited to camp stoves? Well, I, I, doesn't it already, Rob, doesn't it already say no open flame? It says flameless. Flameless. Flameless facilities, but that could just be referring to uh, not having the ability to have a campfire, right? right. Because every, there, I mean, there's there's picnic tables, you know, there's there's all sorts of. I I think you just say flameless facilities shall include no um, um, no camp stoves. No camp stoves. Just to tell you the foolishness about Ramirez Canyon. Let's see, you're gonna go up there and you're gonna spend two days, you're gonna eat cold cereal, uh, no coffee. Um, you're not gonna cook your dinner at night because you gotta heat it up. I mean, the more you talk about this, the more you realize that they've said flame us, but it doesn't work. Because you gotta have you gotta have heat to do your food prep. Rob, does are they gonna have electricity? I mean. In the in the, I mean, do you know that far ahead? Are they going to have electricity to the campsites? I they doubt should. it. I, I guess I. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Does it's? I, I if, think it's if they do, they there. should all be. Uh, was it G GFIs? Yeah. Um, All electrical outlets should be GFIs. Is that, I mean, is, or is it GFCI? What, it's what GFIs, is it? but they would, they would have to be GFIs if they were outside. Anyway. That's electrical law. What is GFI? Ground fault interrupter. Ground what? Fault. Am I correct? Did I say that right, Rob? Yeah, that, that, that's correct, Chris. Yeah. Ground, ground fault circuit. Fault. Yeah, ground fault circuit interrupters. 
Yeah, is it GFCI and GFI. So they're the they're the same exact device. Uh, device. Yeah. Okay. You have them all over your house, Mary. Those the ones with the red buttons. That's the yeah. one. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Do we need so, a revised list to see what we're working with? What's that? Do we need a revised list uh, on the screen? Um, I'm afraid, but I'm going to try. Um, motion, hold on. Edit. Save. OK, can we refresh that, Parker? Because I just modified it slightly. Scroll down to the bottom. That's where I'll know if there's reference to the GFI, I'll know that it took. Yep. Okay, so that's the revised list. Do we know if this is the MRCA's first foray into establishing a camping a camp a campground? I mean, this is the first one in the city, our city. But are there any others? I, I had the same question. <laughs> they have the small campground supposedly at the Ramirez Canyon, back at this. Oh yeah, you're right. I saying. You're right. Back I don't where? Know whoever uses it, it's so small. No, no, it's closed. You talking about the old Barbara Streisand property? Yeah. No, that's closed down. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's that's fully gated. It is. I thought it was the. As far as I know, I've been. I was back there maybe a year ago. Maybe it just burned, and they haven't done anything with it. But they touted it in the er in the eir proposal that they showed us. That part of the idea is to connect the two campgrounds together. So they they made it sound like it was operational. Yeah. No. That. It, Nobody's going back there. There's a, well, first of all, there's nowhere to no way to get there. You know, hey Ron, isn't the access to that campground going to be off Canaan? Yeah, yeah. They're because not going to be going down Ramirez. They're going to be coming off of Canaan on the old Lava property, Al Lava property that they bought. It's contiguous. But so, but other than that, do we know of any other MRCA campgrounds in this in the state? I don't know of any, but I'm sure we could Google it, find out. I think, though, at this point, Josh, yeah. I, I, fellow commissioners, we need to. We need to move along with what we've got here in front of Mary and, uh, and, and try to get something, get this thing crafted and approved so we can send it to council. Yeah, you're right. Um, I just, um, I just Googled this. They have, they have other campgrounds. You know, don't they have a gate and a caretaker back there, Josh? It, are you saying in Ramirez Canyon? Yeah. I think there's a gate back there where you were talking about, but, and there's a caretaker. That used to be their headquarters. That used to be where Edelman was. You know who knows that property well, Susan, is Gabe. He's been back there quite a few times. Just throwing that out there. Let's move along, though, with what we've got. Um, Doug, do you have anything you want to add or subtract? No, I've, I've looked it over. I'm okay with this because uh, it's really just a recommendation of the council what to consider and the staff to consider as they write their response. I think this is good. Josh? 
I'm okay for now. I think, look, I think that we're going to have a lot, many more opportunities to take a few shots at this because, Agreed. you know, it's, it, this is going to take years and years for them to go through the city. I mean, it's CDPs aren't easy. So, um, and we have an opportunity to speak as private citizens. Um, the council knows who we are, so we can say hey, we're private citizens, but I mean, we're, you know, clearly commissioners. So, Clearly. Does somebody want to be make the a one motion to approve the motion? The motion? <laughs> yeah. I'll make the motion to approve the uh, to approve the motion. Okay. Right. I'll second Josh. Okay. Keegan, did I didn't ask you if you were good with the whole thing? Yeah, no, it looks great. I, you guys are you guys are crushing it. I think it's, it's great. Okay. Yeah. You're you're part of the crunch there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're not leaving you out of the crunch. If I Thanks. can call the vote, can I call the vote? Yeah, call for it. Okay, Chair Frost? Yes. Commissioner Spiegel? Yes. Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you for that lively and informative discussion. Um, now I'm gonna call for another motion to be made to adjourn the meeting. I'll make the motion to adjourn. And I will second. Thank you. <laughs> okay. go, test those, uh, go test those GFIs, Mary. Vice Chair, yeah, Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Chair Frost. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Gibbs. Yes. Commissioner Spiegel. Yes. Motion carries, we're done. Awesome. Thank you everyone and thank you Parker for being there in the background and whoever I, I think Brandy is helping too. No, just Parker. No, she Brandy's at school now, so it's it's Parker and me on our own. Yeah, but I I see everybody else, Arthur and everybody else yeah. hung in there and Louise. Thank you to everybody, everybody that helped tonight. Mm -hmm. Um, awesome. Thank you, Drew Smith. Bye, Drew. Yeah. All right. Good night, everybody.